Good morning, gentlemen. Acme Pollution Inspection. We're cleaning up the world, and we thought this was a suitable starting point with episode 007 of A Review to a Kill, which is a look back on the James Bond film franchise presented to you by fanboysanonymous.com. Let's introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Plenty. Plenty of Mango. Good, good Lord, what a terrible name that would be. Jeez. <laughs> Obviously, you should know us by now. I'm Tony Mango. With me are Robert D. Felice. Hello, Mr. Mango. And Callum Wiggins. I speak English. (laughs) (laughs) I was wondering what the scenarios were going to be this time around. I totally forgot about that part. (laughs) Well, you totally took my plenty, so I had to come up with something on the fly. Oh, man. Yeah, we're talking about Diamonds Are Forever for this edition, so strap yourselves in, because this is maybe, I don't even know if it's a maybe, I think it might be a guaranteed weirdest Bond film ever. Uh, There's plenty of weird elements in all the Bond films, and this one was just like, I don't know, all of them? (laughs) And just sort of, any idea you got, toss them out there. So, in the same regard, any ideas that you have, toss them in the comment section below. Tell us your thoughts on this movie. Tell us your thoughts on our breakdown of this film and everything else that we got going on here. The best thing you should be doing for that is dropping a comment on the YouTube video. So while you're over there, hit the like button because that'll help us grow. That'll help us on the SEO. Give us a little bit of juice there. Hit the share button if you got any James Bond friends or fa- fans, friends, family. I don't know. <laughs> I'm botching all my Fs right here. Uh, that might be interested in checking this out. If you are not subscribed already to the YouTube channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring that little notification bell as well, just to get some things out of the way as far as the other kinds of plugs. If you want to help us grow in the future on a different side of things, maybe on the monetary side, then toss some spare change our way through the Patreon, patreon.com slash fanboys anonymous. Take advantage of those different tiers we have there. We also have the merchandise shops on TeePublic and Redbubble. Trying to think of some designs that we could do based off of our jokes or whatever of this uh, review to a kill. So if you have any suggestions for like t-shirt designs or, you know, uh, phone case things or whatever. Maybe you got a shower curtain uh, idea in mind. Maybe when it comes to the man with the golden gun or something, I don't know. Then, uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll get around to that. Actually, more so maybe even with Severine in uh, Skyfall. Now I'm thinking of shower curtain stuff in the Bond movies. I'm going to get sidetracked. Um, that'll be a riveting podcast, wouldn't it? Let's talk about the shower curtains in Bond's uh, history. <laughs> uh, we're not doing that. We're talking Diamonds Are Forever. Um, the film has a couple foreign language titles. What I've been doing recently is checking into that, seeing if there's anything interesting. None of them really super crazy. Here's a couple that I thought were, at the very least, somewhat worth talking about. Um, Brazil tends to have a... Uh, you add 007 into the mix. So this one's with 007, the diamonds are forever. Uh, Spain has diamonds for eternity. Most of them are diamonds are forever because it's just normal words. So they don't have to like translate anything too weird. Turkey just says immortal diamonds. Uh, Italy, for some reason, is a diamonds cascade. Well, that was a little kind of flourishing. I like that. And uh, Germany got a little... Um, like, uh, I don't know, I guess, like, just sort of, let's just call it this, diamond fever. <laughs> just like, you got diamond fever, you know. No uh, 007 to the rocket base. I was disappointed that there wasn't something that said, like, 007 goes to the moon or something, you know. 007 fakes the moon landing. Yeah. Maybe we'll get more into that with Moonraker. 007 leaving Las Vegas. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. All bets are on 007 or... Uh, 007, um, I don't know, catches a show with Shady Tree or something. Coming to America and coming is spelled like... <laughs> <laughs> spelled like what? You know, C-O-M... <laughs> it's kids watching this. Better not be. Kids, uh, this podcast is not for you. Um, neither is this movie. No, neither is this movie. Uh, <laughs> we're getting to some of that in a little bit. Uh, to start things off, we got to address the elephant in the room. Hey, Barry. We're not well, talking about uh, John Barry here. We'll talk about the music. But uh, the main thing that you start this movie off with is uh, that we got Bond switching again. Um, there's a weird, like, there's a couple films where it's like, uh, we go from You Only Live Twice as Connery, 
And then we go to a new Bond in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Then we go to a different Bond in this one. And then in the next movie, we're going to get a different Bond. So we didn't have a, a regular Bond for a couple films here. And after his time in You Only Live Twice, Connery's like, that's it. I'm done. I'll never be Bond again until this film and he returns. Then he's like, that's it. I mean it. I'm done for real. I'll never be Bond again until he comes back for Never Say Never Again. And then he's like, that's it. I'm not joking this time. I'm done. Until he voices Bond in the From Russia With Love video game. <laughs> so... Connery just couldn't escape this role. Um, he made a fuck ton of money doing this. Uh, yeah. I think he's very good at the role. He's at this point my number two. <laughs> it's, the only, uh, it's only two bonds at this point. Well, I mean, overall, obviously, of the ones we've seen, he's number one. He Wait a minute. Then, so how's he's your number one and number two? I said he's number two overall, meaning in the whole. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I think that's what we've seen so far. No, I think he was paid like it was like a million and a half at this point, which is probably just like I think that was the number that I saw. It may have been more, but it was like a huge sum of money at this point in time. And then also part of the deal meant that he got to make two movies that he wanted to make through the production company. Um, I can't remember what the first one was. I think the I think the second one actually didn't end up coming to fruition because. It was meant to be a story. I think he was going to do like a version of Macbeth. Of Macbeth. I think so. And then a, a different uh, film production company already came out with a version of Macbeth in the years between that. So they decided, yeah, we're not going to do that instead. And then and then he just never got his second movie. Yeah, he. Uh, I think he donated a portion of his um, salary, if not... Or that might have been Never Said Ever Again, now that I'm thinking about it. But he, he positioned himself in a way where they were like, well, we feel like we need to get James Bond back. People are not responding so well with Lazenby. Lazenby doesn't want to continue. They thought about casting some other people. They actually did cast somebody else in the role as like a backup, and they ended up having to pay him because they got Connery back, and it was like past the point of his contract, so they just had to pay him out. So it would have been interesting to see maybe a different Bond. I don't know if he would have done great or not. No, like Adam West type of thing. I forget the guy's name. But um, they didn't have a whole lot of like faith in this movie and they went back to the philosophy of let's do goldfinger again because of how successful that one was so they once again revisited the idea that maybe they should have goldfinger's twin brother and this one would be goldfinger's obsessed with gold so this guy's obsessed with diamonds uh that's why they got shirley bassey back that's why they got director guy hamilton back they pretty much were like goldfinger is the one that we are using as our benchmark let's try to do goldfinger again i don't feel like this is goldfinger you guys? <laughs> no, it's, 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 I mean it's not. It's not golf shinger. I mean, it's it's incredible that a movie that has so many batshit insane moments in it could also be so boring as well. Yeah, in a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one hundred percent agree with Callum. And no, this is not Goldfinger. This is not even an incredible simulation of Goldfinger. This is just its own weird masterpiece. Like, at its best or worst, this would be Goldfinger on an acid trip. And it's just, like, a bad parody. Yeah, it's got... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bad parody. It's got some awful villains in this, which we'll obviously discuss. It's got one of the worst Bond girls that you could imagine as well. Not, not in looks-wise, but obviously just in terms of being completely ineffective and I bar none into bond. bar none thus far the worst bond girl Spoiler. yeah and it's just and it's a bit all over the place i was kind of relieved early on in the movie where they find out that he's going to holland and not south africa because i was really worried about that point <laughs> <laughs> after the, uh, the kind of things with the only love twice <laughs> yeah i mean it wouldn't have been put past me at that point. So I was like, oh, Bond's got to black up for this movie. That's like, that could be the uh, the way they go with it. <laughs> be like, you must become uh, South African. <laughs> He's already bad enough with the Scottish accent. The Scottish South African is not going to work too much. Well. <laughs> I mean, we'll get into a little bit more of that. But, um, you know, when you're watching On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and we were talking about this when we were doing the past, past one. Obviously, go back and check it out if you didn't um, listen to that review. 
you're assuming, based off of the end of the last film, Tracy's got a bullet in the head. Bond just got married. And she died, like, immediately afterward. Bond's going to go on this kill-crazy rampage. And Blofeld is fucked. Blofeld's not in the book. This is the fourth book, actually, and it took him this long to get around to. Um, I never read the book, so I don't know exactly what it is. I know that it's mostly about just the diamond smuggling, and it's about the the mob type stuff, and uh, it's like Serafino Spang and Jack Spang, I think, are the villains or whatever. But this feels like the movie that should have came after the Blofeld revenge story. Like they should have gone dark as hell, Bond hunting Blofeld, kill the bastard. And then try to balance it out with something a little bit more jovial and have like a different villain. Because if Blofeld's not in the book, they shoved Blofeld in here. And it's just well, ludicrous. Well, yeah, not only one Blofeld, they shoved guy. multiple Blofelds. Yeah. Oh, and the guy, they get to play him. Yeah, it's, it's a revisit as well. Yeah. <laughs> Get to um, see that uh, the one guy. Oh, I'm trying to remember what his uh, name was. What was his name in um, uh, You Only Live Twice? Henderson he was, uh, yeah, Dicko Henderson. Uh, Charles Gray is the actor. And for some reason, despite the fact that two movies ago, that it's like, there you go, that was Bond's ally and whatever. They're like, you could be Goldfinger, uh, not Goldfinger, you could be Blofeld, why not? <laughs> I mean, in fairness, he was in that other movie for a about five minutes in total. Yeah, so probably still. Like, nobody probably remembered. I think it's more passable when it's like, let's recast the guy who was the, I don't know, the communications operator, and then we'll make him the other communications operator. You know, like then you can get away with that more. It's, yeah, we've talked about before. I mean, uh, the one Gypsy is, uh, uh, she comes on to play Paula. In Thunderball and uh, Maud Adams is in three Bond films as three different characters. Well, she's not really a character in one of them. She's just a cameo. But um, they do that. And it just seems such a weird decision to make to be like, well, we got to follow up on Blofeld. So let's make Blofeld the villain here. And also, let's make this not at all a follow up to Honor Majesty's Secret Service. No, Bond doesn't care at this point. He's completely forgotten about Tracy. Well, that was the other guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this never happened to the other guy. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we start this movie off with old black and white footage of Connery in the gun barrel because they didn't want to refilm it again. So we're back to black and white for that, but whatever. I hate this opening for so many reasons. They start off with Japan, making it kind of seem like they're disregarding on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And there's this horrible dubbing on the guy who says that Blofeld's in Cairo, which is just like, you can't get the dubbing done right. You're Awful. seven films into this, and it's just like, his mouth doesn't move, and it's like, Cairo! Come on. Painfully bad dubbing. Connery's voice sounds like he's dubbed by a terrible actor. Yes. It doesn't even sound like him. My name's yeah, Bond. Sure James Bond. I guess they're trying, they trying to protect the fact that just pretending that it wasn't Connery for a little while. Because to be fair, you look at Connery, this is not the Connery four years ago. This guy's no. Old. That quick. Like, I mentioned it and You Only Live Twice that he wasn't looking as, like, uh, he's a little bit more worse for the wear in You Only Live Twice compared to, we, like, especially compared to Dr. No. Like, there is a drastic difference between Dr. No and You Only Live Twice. And then you go Dr. No and uh, Diamonds for Forever and you're like, oh, damn, that's his dad. <laughs> I mean, for context, he's only 41 when this movie came out. Yeah. And he doesn't, he looks like he's about in his late 40s rather than his early 40s. I would think 50s. He is graying and he's got very, a significant amount of wrinkles. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past him to be that. So that re reveal is awkward as hell too, because they go out of their way to like, it's not even Bond that's doing it. I mean, it's not even Connery. <laughs> it's uh, Bob Simmons. His stuntman is the one that they're filming on the shots where it's not Connery. So they really went out of their way to be like, you don't see bond. You don't see bond. But then the third shot, you see bond. So why even bother? And the, my name's bond, James bond. It's awkward. Uh, there's a good little moment where he flips the bikini top around on Marie to strangle her, to get yeah. some information. That's the, uh, 
another instance of nudity for those who are getting uh, check marks on that. That's our first uh, full topless person. Yeah, there is no subtlety in that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just see two full on nipples. So. Yeah. Uh, I, the fair, comment... though, I was surprised. I thought he was legitimately just, hey, I'm back and I'm already having sex. Cause... You thought he was just going to bang her? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, well, we're going right here immediately. Great. To be fair, we don't see if it happened afterward. <laughs> <laughs> he could have been like, thanks for telling me that information. Now I'm going to throw on the charm or something. I don't know. You never know. But we do get introduced to Blofell because there's this plastic surgery going on. And I don't know about you guys, but I did not think plastic surgery involved people bathing in this mustardy goop that looks like mud or baby shit or something. Well, I, I was more intrigued by the fact that he's clearly already had plastic surgery because he looks nothing like the Blofeld in the previous movie. Yeah, he's got so, hair now. He doesn't yeah. have the scar anymore or the missing earlobes. He's British. Yeah, and he looks just like Henderson. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I don't know what this cold goop mess is. Like, you can, I couldn't guess what material they're using for that. I assume it's just some sort of yellow clay. Yeah, it's got to be something like that. But, like, yeah. like, how does that... Like, what? Who the fuck... <laughs> just, that already is, like, you lost me on, like, you know, the bad dubbing, okay, whatever. The black and white footage of the gun barrel, okay, fine. Bad delivery of the line, sure. But who in their right mind goes, okay, we're going to do a plot about Blofeld having these doppelgangers. And it's like, all right, well, that's a little bit hokey, but okay. And they go, how do we show that? I know, a mud bath. You're just going to engulf yourself in mud and that's going to be a part of the process? Oh, and it, the Blofeld's got the terrible line, making mud pies, 007. He would have yeah. been me in a matter of days if you gave the poor fellow a chance and whatever. It's like, uh. this, guy, this guy is terrible with his lines. Like, he is so, he's way too corny. To be Blofeld, like, what I liked so much about the previous Blofeld is that he did have some good lines like that, but he felt more visceral. This guy seems like I don't know someone's dad decided to play villain in a um, yeah you know, for, for their kids or something like that. It says, "Oh, you nearly got me, 007, That sort of thing. It's just it's a bit more like Carry On Bond rather than James Bond. That's a very British reference. You probably wouldn't get so. Uh, I didn't it, over my head. <laughs> no, there's a series of like uh, British movies called uh, Carry On films, which are essentially like that. Who are Mrs. That sort of thing. It's like that. that, that this whole like um, uh, very very. You know, I, I'm trying to think of like any example you might have seen. Have you seen like the, these sort of movies where it's like the um, uh, like the plumber movies and stuff like that, where it's just a load of slapstick and British humor and stuff like that. Like a sure. um, Benny Hill type thing. Yeah, so, so, sort of along those lines. It's very misogynistic. It's very just of the time. It's, yeah, that sort of thing. It's just like the, the big punchline to a woman's bra comes off, that sort of thing. That's the, the whole, <laughs> whereas like this guy feels like he would fit far more into that than in a bomb movie. With like a slide whistle? Yeah. <laughs> like this like this Blofeld seems like he's a parody Blofeld. Mm -hmm. Well, this movie's a parody movie. We established that already. This feels more like an Austin Powers movie, doesn't it? Yes. Absolutely. Like, it's an Austin Powers movie that they didn't realize they were making a comedy, and it was just that bad. And I feel bad about, like, Charles Gray. I haven't seen him in any other movies other than these two that I'm aware of, but I like his voice, and I, I like how he has this kind of mean-looking face to him. I feel like if he was in a serious Bond film, he might be able to actually be a good Blofeld, but... He's not. <laughs> villain. Yeah, yeah, just a, another good villain. He could have been fine. I think the fact that he's attached to the Blofeld is actually yeah. killing him. If they would have called this Diamonds Are Forever and had, obviously, if they would have made it a little bit more serious and, you know, I mean, you could have, like, you need to have humor. Humor is one of the seven elements that we break down in this. But you go too into Goofy and you throw that that is Blofeld out of all people. Like, Blofeld, at this point, he's brutal in from Russia with love. He's only spoken of, spoken of in the background of Dime, uh, Dr. No. He's not a factor of Goldfinger. He's pretty brutal in Thunderball. 
and you only live twice, he's like, oh, wow, they didn't do a good job with that one. And in No One Her Majesty's Secret Service, he fucking kills his wife. And in this one, they're like, they're making mud pies, 007. <laughs> it's like, mm, damn it. And Blofeld's goon goes to grab Bond's gun, and he's got a fucking mousetrap in a suit. Well, no, Tony. Now, when you get married, are you not going to keep the just in case mousetrap in your suit? I I know for one thing, I'm not going to have uh, flowers on the car that I have to take off just in case. <laughs> No, it's about precedent set. <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to say we have all the time in the world, just to be sure. Um, but, like, that mousetrap thing, we're going to talk about this when we wrap up the whole thing and we talk about gadgets. Absolutely stupid. That is full-blown parody crap. It's not even parody crap. It's just not good. <laughs> <laughs> and he tosses some intr- instruments into one of the guards, and that's terrible acting. He's just like, uh, uh, uh. You got me. And then he follows that up with uh, Blofeld. Blofeld into a a vat of hot liquid. He smacks Blofeld with the thing, the like the whatever that I don't know. It's like a dentistry type of thing. Yeah. And the way that he hits him is like it's terrible. Like the choreography, because Blofeld just lunges forward and waits to get hit very calmly, and is just knocked out cold for like five seconds. And he yeah, straps him onto this gurney and shoves him into this mud bath crap that's bubbling and says, welcome to hell, Blofeld. And his cat screams and we get a transition into the title sequence. It's terrible. So, if, again, so I had a sneaky suspicion that Blofeld wasn't actually dead, so that, right. I, I kept that in my mind. But obviously, if you just go into this movie and you, I'm not saying like... Well, I really enjoyed On Her Majesty's Secret Service, so at the very least, I'd want a follow-up to it, even mm-hmm. if I liked it or I disliked it. And then the follow-up you get is essentially, as far as you're aware, Blofeld dies in the first two minutes of this movie. <laughs> yeah. After a gag with a mouse trap and a bunch of mud bath crap. Not even mm-hmm. like the film starts off with Bond sneaking into Blofeld's lair and shooting him in the head, where you'd be like, okay, he got, you know, like vengeance for it we burned him alive or he i don't know he beat him to death with a torture device it's like no he smacks him over the head with a thing shoves him into a vat of mud and he's just like well there you go and the cat's like (laughs) absolutely terrible garbage intro i feel like they tried to cram too much Hey, Bond's back. Connery's back. Here's everything. Here's him interacting with a woman. And you think he's going to seduce her, but he actually chokes her. Here's this. Here's that. I think that they tried too hard to get too much in. So at this point, I think you can tell this is one of my least favorite ones. (laughs) You're you're going to get a lot of me uh, complaining about this movie on this podcast, everybody. That's right. I can can join you this time. I'm not going to be trying to fight you on the other side. (laughs) Is that going to be a trifecta? We're all going to crap all over this movie? I'm pretty sure of that because you already saw my reaction to my favorite part of the movie because it was in the trailer. (laughs) As much as I hate almost everything about this movie, I absolutely love the song diamonds are forever agree i think it's the best one it's not like, like, it's it's i mean if not the best one it's definitely top five for me yeah shirley bassey's back and shirley bassey's just amazing the mm-hmm. lyrics are great you know uh diamonds are forever uh you talk about the whole idea of like um I don't really like the lines, uh, hold one up and then caress it, but it's like, you know, it's kind of got the sexy element to it and touch it, stroke it and undress it. You're like, oh, okay, what the hell's going on here? But uh, it's all about, I don't need a man. I got diamonds and whatever. And that translates a little bit more to the book because in the book, apparently um, Tiffany Case is kind of like, uh, I'm not into men, period. Not like she's, you know, pussy galore, but like um, she is just sort of like, I will take care of myself. I'm into diamonds and getting rich and whatever. And it's just a damn good song. Mm. It's so catchy. It's a great one to to listen to. It's one of my absolute favorite songs. 
very good. And this, at least this sequence, I enjoyed way more than the last two. So I thought this was like a return to form. Yeah, I think that was the way they kind of try and put it together as well. They get Shirley Bassey back for the entire thing. So they're trying to just, okay, this is, we went off piece maybe with the last movie with Lays and So this is a return to form. Obviously it's not, but it, you know, it's like <laughs> in terms of the actual movie itself, but at least they got the title sequence really, really on the nose here. And yeah, I, I like, I love the ending part of it as well, where she's just like repeating like Diamonds of Forever with that little bass riff going underneath it as well. It's so, it's so good. Uh, I'm not a huge, huge, huge fan of the visuals. There's better ones. There's worse ones. It's just diamonds and women. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's diamonds, women, and cats. Yeah, it's par for the I course. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than the previous one, so I'll give it a thumbs up on that regard. We got that going on, and you know, I mean, I could go on and on about that, but um. Despite the fact that that's not groundbreaking, and it's—I mean, I guess like the, the biggest effect is the disco effect on the dancing woman silhouette. And it's what it is. It, it's more so just listen to this great song. And uh, at least as far as the rankings go for me on the music, this is my favorite Bond theme so far. Um, it's always been one of my absolute favorite ones. I—I I, I know it's not going to be my favorite ultimately, especially because I've watched these movies a million times. I've listened to the songs a million times. I've done my tier list already. This is I'm doing a secondary tier list or whatever. Um, I know it's not my absolute favorite, but it's definitely, definitely up there. It's probably in my top five. And, uh, you know, we have more than 25 uh, songs, so that's saying a lot. From what we've been through, this is my number two. I still put Goldfinger number one, but this is number two. Now, did you say that this ranks for you, Callum? Yeah, I'd say this is my, it's definitely the favorite one so far out of all of them. So it's like, terrible intro, one of the best Bond themes. <laughs> it's a jarring difference. But we go into uh, some of the setup stuff. We got M. Uh, he basically is like, well, now that Blofeld's dead, get back to work, asshole. <laughs> kind of like, yeah, that, these guys seem to hate each other now. They real, it's needlessly mean. It's like his wife died minutes after their wedding. Yeah, he's going to want to go after the guy that killed him. And he's just like, you're going to go back to normal work, jerk? <laughs> <laughs> now, that, now that you're back to, you know, sweeping the floors, dickwad, maybe you can, <laughs> it's like, relax, M, you were at the wedding. You probably heard the gunshots, you know? But Bond is, uh, Alexa, what are you doing? Stop. I thought I heard a question. <laughs> okay, Alexa, stop. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. Um, I think when you said asshole. Maybe. Heard. Maybe that's why it's not con uh, controlling my TV right now. <laughs> it needs to go by hey, asshole, asshole. What's the weather like? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Bond is at his snootiest here, maybe. Yeah. He remarks about the sherry, and M gleefully, because he hates him so much, corrects him. He's like, there is no year for sherry, and Bond just uppercuts him <laughs> with the snobbiest. I was referring to the original vintage in which the sherry was based, sir. 1851. Unmistakable. <laughs> so good. This apparently came about because they wrote a line about the sherry, and uh, I forget if it was... um. Like one of the producers or somebody, somebody along the lines was like, uh, yeah, that's not a real thing. And then they like, were like, uh, how do we replace this with whatever? And they just kind of did that. But of course, uh, a couple moments later, Bond asked about what he knows about diamonds and he casually just remarks like, oh, it's a girl's best friend or whatever. And M is so quick to be like, it's refreshing to hear there's one subject you're not an expert on. It's like, they might as well just fucking fight. <laughs> You would, would have thought of all things that he could could and could not be an expert on, like the most like sought after substance in the world would be something you kind of want to be brushed up on a little bit more. It's like, okay, yeah, I don't know anything about diamonds, but I know about this sherry and I know out uh uh, well, I'm trying to think the most like inane thing, but but lepidoptery and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know everything that I need to know about that sort of thing. But diamonds, yeah, I have no idea. I mean, he's very, like, anybody could have said the lines that he said about the diamonds. He's like, oh, it's the hardest substance. Looks pretty. <laughs> like, that kind of thing. That's, like, just to throw you off with the sherry comment or whatever. 
Now that feels very Goldfinger because they did that same kind of exchange with the gold and uh, Bond about the, I forget what it was. It was like the Dom Perignon or something. Mm. These movies always make me want to figure out how to play Chemin de Fer and how to know more about liquor, but I don't drink. So <laughs> it's not really uh, not ever going to happen for me. Um, they kind of, and they even said this on the commentary, they kind of just blah, blah, blah. Here's what diamonds are about. Let's move on. That's it's all just exposition. Mm -hmm. And we get this whole thing about how they're smuggling diamonds through this whole dentistry practice. And we're introduced to the primary henchmen of the film, Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid. Mr. Kid is played by somebody who's never acted before at that point. Putter Smith. Don't say. He is a bass player, a jazz musician. So, oh, I'm surprised that he's not like the head of his own um, IT company. <laughs> <laughs> I can Based see out it. of his mum's basement. <laughs> <laughs> One of those like uh, back in the day where it was like, we were working on computers and they've got like those uh, those sheets that you punch cards and whatever. Mm. He's played by Potter Smith. Um, for what it's worth, Despite the fact that he's never acted before, I actually like Mr. Kid. Uh, we'll get into the character a little bit more, but like I think that Putter Smith does a good enough job. I didn't really think that he had never acted before. I just thought that he's written weird. You know who plays Mr. Wint? I feel like I've seen him before, but I can't place it. <laughs> That's exactly the answer I was hoping for. <laughs> yeah, who? So do you know Crispin Glover? I have heard the name, yeah. In uh, Back to the Future, in, okay. uh, he was the villain in one of the uh, Charlie's Angels movies. Uh, I don't know the name of the Oh, was he the Finn Man? Oh, that's what his name is, yeah. I Yeah, I thought I recognized that. That can't be him, surely. No, it's his, his dad. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. Who it is. Because obviously, yeah, the Finn Man was too, would be way too young to, in Charlie's Angels movie to be in this one. I was going to say, that's not the resemblance is. Yeah, but the resemblance is uncanny. It is. It's yeah. ridiculous. He looks just like his dad. And Bruce Glover, I don't know what other movies he's been in that I've seen, but I literally, for the longest time, I was like, damn, that guy looks like, uh, just like Crispin Glover. And for like years, I went into this idea of like, this dude looks just like Crispin Glover. And I never bothered to like uh, connect the dots or whatever. And then it was just, I don't know, one day when I was like 15 or something, I'm like, oh my God, Bruce Glover, of course he's his father. Like, you know, we got to dive into these characters in a lot of different ways. And I don't even really know where to start. Uh, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll say this. I love their theme. The music that plays with Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid is this, whistling little tune that is one of my favorite little uh pieces of music it's just like it, it's like fun in a weird way but it's uh it's kind of like do 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 and it's just kind of I, I don't know i love it i know you guys don't pay too, too much attention to the music but no. that the, uh no, it didn't really resonate. I was too busy just looking at them and thinking, okay, I'm supposed to take these two seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tony had told me what this movie was going to be about, and I had watched the trailer, and Tony mentioned that there was a gay couple, and I said, well, it's surely not these two, and he said, yeah, it is. <laughs> and, God, that feeling just resonated throughout the rest of the film yeah i mean, I mean they, so they do the thing where they they use a scorpion <sighs> to kill the dentist yeah, who does that... an even more ridiculous death than dude the, all the, the deaths guy. in this movie are bad it's really bad because I, I mean the premise of this isn't bad they pose as the the guy they're taking place of joe and they meet with the dentist dr tynan and they pretend like i mean this is where it gets so it's like bad it's like if you'd say what is the scene and you you know, there's that thing going around where it's like, describe a movie and make it sound bad. And you can say something like, um, uh, one of the things I saw earlier today was uh, a guy goes on a um, killing spree because he didn't get a job promotion. And it's Revenge of the Sith. 
And it's like, yeah, it's a bad way to describe that movie and, you know, whatever. If you describe this in a good way, you can say, so these henchmen, uh, they pose as somebody who is meeting up with somebody who's smuggling diamonds through a dentistry practice by, you know, they're putting it in their teeth and they kill him. They place a, a scorpion in a way that can kill him. And then they give a bomb to this other guy by pretending that they're sent from Dr. Tynan. And then they make off with the diamonds. You go, oh, okay, that sounds kind of cool. But when you get Mr. Went going, ow, my wisdom teeth. Oh, can you check them out? Let me put a scorpion on your back. And he could go, oh, oh, oh my God, I got a scorpion on me, whatever. And oh, it's terrible. Yeah, it ain't great. And and then they pull up some more corny jokes about how um he got he got bit by the bug. <laughs> yeah, I actually like that one. <laughs> well, of course you do. <laughs> I mean I mean to be fair, these guys are losers, so they can do that sort of humor and get away with it. That's like so they, they do the corny jokes, they give a package to the helicopter. That's another thing about this fucking movie. The explosions in this movie <laughs> are the absolute worst. <laughs> the special effects are just I, I, they've regressed ten years. Uh huh. It's it's awful. And and then they um, then like, the, the helicopter blows up and they make another remark about it and then they walk away holding hands. Yeah, if God had intended a man to fly, Mister Wint or whatever, wings. he would have given him wings. Uh, and then they walk off, Mister Kid. They walk off holding hands, which I wish I would have been in a movie theater when this film first came out to see what that reaction was. Yeah. Seeing what people vomiting onto their seats in front of (laughs) And let's, let's put it out there in case anybody thinks that we're going in this direction. There is no part of us that's going to be saying like, LOL gay people. When we, when we are crapping on the way that this film handles it. Instead, we're doing kind of the opposite when we're going to be talking about this. Cause the film very much is like, LOL gay henchmen. And, Obviously, we're looking at this through 2021 eyes. That shouldn't be, like, a character trait of being, like, what if the villains were gay this time? Like, that kind of thing. But it's just a a weird choice to make in this time frame for them to do this kind of thing. And I really, really wish that they would have, like, I could get some kind of reaction from that. Because I don't know if people laughed. I don't know if people... Where like, oh, Bond's got to kill them immediately kind of a thing. I don't know what the reaction was for this. But it's got to have gotten a reaction, you know? Probably confusion first. Because right. we're not entirely sure what their deal is until you see them just holding hands as they walk away. Uh, we're not going to do that. But this movie tries very hard to make you like, huh, look at that. They're gay. Get it? Right. Like, the whole film, I mean, like, literally, right till the very end, <laughs> really wants you to be like that. Oh, God, this was awful. But I will say, and maybe this is more for Callum than you, Tony, because Callum's closer in age to me. But I finally understand where they got those Kids Next Door villains from. Because they literally just ripped off these two guys. Oh, you talk about Codename Kids Next Door? Yes. Codename right, Kids yeah, Next Door, what's that? Oh, it's a, uh, it's a, it was a thing on the Cartoon Network. Uh, yeah, in the, and they literally... In, their, like, in their, like, the early mid-2000s, something like that. And they literally ripped these two guys off. Mm. Almost directly, I forget. Their names weren't, obviously... Uh, it was Mr. Wink and Mr. Fib. Got it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and they look exactly... Or at least the one dude Close. looks exactly like these guys. And it's it's creepy then. And it, to see what it comes from, it's even worse. Because, like, I don't know what the message you're trying to send here is. Is it that gay people are creepy psychopaths? Or, like, what were they trying to accomplish? Because I, I learned nothing about these two. And yet, somehow, they were the final two to die. I will give them a tiny, tiny morsel of credit. There's no direct moment in this movie where they say that they're they're villainous because they're gay. No. Like they could have done that back in this time frame. They could have been like, 
oh, of course the gay characters are are bad. You know, Bond would have made some kind of a quip about like, you know, they gotta they gotta have a real man and like that kind of thing. You know, like you pull a Draco kind kind of thing. But like, yeah, they didn't, they didn't do the like the final death scene of them wasn't Bond inserting one of them inside the other. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's but, where you get into where you go. God damn it, guys! Like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, wait for it. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, we'll certainly get to that because we can't not talk about something as ludicrous as that is. But yeah. they go, they're like the practically the best killers in this whole series so far because they just go on a kill crazy rampage, like uh, different that Bond should have gone. They're killing people more than Bond is at the beginning of this because uh, they pass off the diamonds to this old nanny type woman, Mrs. Whistler. I hate how stupid this movie is. I'm going to go back to this. But. Uh, She's, you know, reading this kind of Dr. Seuss type stuff about, you know, uh, having an umbrella for when the rain comes again and all this. And they give her like the they do the whole diamond trade thing or whatever. And I'm going to skip past uh, a scene and we're going to go back to it because then uh, one scene later, we're at a hovercraft shown for a moment. Uh, we had more hovercraft action and die another day. And very quickly, right afterward, Mrs. Whistler is dead already because dragged out of the canal. Yeah. So she go off the old nanny take pictures for the children. <laughs> <laughs> I hate how stupid this movie is. <laughs> I mean, part of me likes how stupid they are, but like, it just makes me difficult to find them in any way intimidating, even though, like Tony says, they're the biggest killers in this entire movie, and maybe this entire franchise so far in terms of henchmen, but they're so unintimidating. Mm -hmm. It's such a weird juxtaposition. In I between... Mean, I, I, oh, God. I was going to say, I, I, I mean, you can make your point, because I was going to go back to the thing that you skipped over, but I assume you're going to head yeah. on to that later on anyway. So. No, no, it's like, they're very... They're very focused on their task, and they do get a lot done better than any Bond villain I've seen. At one point, I was legitimately like, oh, well, Bond should just die here. Like, this was <laughs> good. <laughs> so in between those two scenes of introducing Mrs. Whistler and killing Mrs. Whistler, we got our Money Penny scene, where she um, gets some action kind of in the field a little bit. She replaces Peter Frank's passport, and there's a, an exchange with her and Bond. Of um, what can I bring you back from Holland? A diamond in a ring. Would you settle for a tulip? And she's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. Right. Okay, so it's painfully obvious watching it that they're clearly not in the same scene with each other at any point. They aren't. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, do you read to tell me that wasn't in the same scene? <laughs> no, they they shot it. They shot it so easily to the point of like okay so now we can only see lois lois maxwell in this part we can only see connery in this part it's just mm. okay it's just like these two clearly hated each other at this point and didn't want to be involved in the same scene yeah they didn't really have like a money penny scene worked out and they kind of were like we got to put money penny in here somewhere let's do this and we'll film it in two separate shots and we'll just take care of it that way they won't have to worry about it anymore. They're not going to be in the same scene together anymore because we're going to move on to Roger Moore in the next film and things will be different for Lois Maxwell. But I still love Money Penny. Still great. Still one of my favorite characters in the whole franchise. And it's, yeah. it's sad. You know, would you settle for a tulip? And she's just like, yeah. <laughs> like, <you know. laughs> Give me a, a flower and I'll, I'll fawn all over you. It's like, oh, you need to, you need to find somebody who treats you well, Money Penny. <laughs> So then we go and we meet another woman. We meet Tiffany Case. Uh, Bond introduces himself as Franks, Peter Franks. I thought that was a neat little touch. So clearly he's just got that baked inside of his uh, himself. And um, we got this jazzy version of the Diamonds Are Forever theme playing. I like it. They use it quite a bit throughout the film in different ways. And it's just a good little, like, I didn't like how they did the we have all the time in the world when Bond is just uh, going through the hotel room in Honor Majesty Secret Service. It didn't seem like a fit. But this little jazzy do, 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 do. I'm like, I dig it, you know. Yeah. And uh, Tiffany Case is a blonde. And then she's a brunette. And Bond calls her out on this and he's just like, mm, weren't you a blonde? And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, she's wearing this skimpy lingerie. She looks fantastic, of course. Bond later 
goes on to say, that's quite a nice little nothing you're almost wearing. <laughs> I approve. <laughs> I have to say, in this one, I haven't got, like, many examples written down, but the innuendo in this movie went to just new levels. Oh, this like, is not 12 it, out of a 10. Yeah, no, just, like, it wasn't, like, in other movies, it's been a bit more playful and a little bit more subtle. This one is basically saying, wow, nice knockers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the line, though. I like how that's, like, nobody talks like that, you know? Nobody would say, that's quite a nice little nothing you're almost wearing. But it's a good, like, Bond would say that kind of a thing. Uh, just a means to be like, well, that's not much clothes or whatever. And T- Tiffany gets his fingerprints off his glass. She verifies who he is. They're establishing that she's very attractive. She has a bite to her with her dialogue. She's smart. She's capable since she does the prints and all that. For all intents and purposes, she's off to a great start all downhill from here yeah <laughs> yeah yep. i mean jill st john super attractive i'm not digging the red hair because she becomes a red hair uh a redhead in her third outfit uh that's really my only knock like she's got a beautiful face she's got a good body she's got the sexy attitude and she turns into a complete fucking bimbo yep. yeah i mean I mean, yeah, I don't know whether I'd go. I mean, bimbo is probably a, a good phrase for it, but I'd probably go just more just basket case. Uh, yeah, the phrase that I'd go for it. Instead. Incompetent. Yeah, completely incompetent. Which is, it's like they switched the entire script from that scene to the rest of the movie. Like they were like, let's introduce this capable Bond girl, and then actively sabotage her the whole rest of the film. <laughs> kind of there is a certain point where there's a switch over and we'll get to that when we get to it, it involves a cage uh <laughs> but it's such a shame because if she would stay this tiffany case throughout the whole film she'd be an amazing bond girl yep turns out she's not mm, not in the slightest bit uh we see that bond's been using q's special fingerprints good gadget totally yeah, better than the mousetrap much better. Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't. They wouldn't work out well together, would they? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's got a time. padding to it. <laughs> but uh, Peter Franks is on his way there, as previously scheduled. So Bond pretends to be making out with himself to avoid being spotted. <laughs> That's not Austin Powers at all. I it's hate good. how stupid this movie is. Well, well, it's, it's it's more than that. It's just the stupid that he's making out of himself. Secondly, he then goes up to Peter Franks, looking like himself. <laughs> yeah. So it's like. He could have just stood there. He doesn't know who this guy is. Yeah, he has no, he's completely innocuous. Mm. Just be yourself. And he makes it even worse because he does what Callum's referencing <laughs> on this. Did. He pretends to be somebody yeah. from Holland, or I guess, I don't know, with the, uh, I speak English and whatever, this dumb yeah. accent or whatever. Oh, God, it's terrible. So I, don't know whether he's, I don't know whether he's trying to do German or Flemish or something like that, but he's definitely just putting on some sort of like crazy Dutch accent. Like I was kind of like in my mind thinking, is this better or worse than Mike Myers' gold member? Yeah. <laughs> Freaky deaky Dutch. <laughs> it's really, but, really bad. But then it has one of my favorite. It's followed by one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie, which is the fight in the elevator. Oh, it's a great fight in the elevator. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's a great scene. Maybe like, one of the best fights I've seen in the whole franchise. Just like hand to hand, I thought this was so good and it actually felt like wow bond is capable of just taking a man out at all cost you got like I mean, uh scrambling for like glass shards to stab each other with bonds in, uh, ends up taking them out with a uh fire extinguisher and it's kind of like reminiscent of the train fight from from much with love so yeah, they're like Every once in a while, this movie goes into something where you're like, damn, that's a good idea. If this was a good film, that would have worked really well in it. <laughs> you know? mm. Yeah, it's just, I mean, we talked about last uh, in the last uh, movie how we kind of enjoyed the fact that Lazenby was a more athletic Bond. And so he could do a few more things that were a bit more cinematic in terms of his fights. But this one's very visceral. And I think Connery does that better than Lazenby at this point. Yeah, you feel like the punch is a little bit more. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's clo- when it's close action and it's just a bit like, okay, these two just like fight or die in a really tight, confined space, then yeah, the Conry does an excellent job of it. 
and uh, he swaps the uh, wallets. So <laughs> Tiffany Case grabs the wallet and she goes, you just killed James Bond. And he goes, is that who it was? So Bond has died five times so far in this franchise <laughs> in some fashion. Hold on. Because Tiffany clearly knows who James Bond is. That's another question. Because she clearly says, well, you don't just kill James Bond away for the police to show up. Mm-hmm. How do you not know who you're talking to? I mean, so she she knows the name. As far, well, it's, that's basically as far as we can tell with that side of it. So she may not know who she he looks like, but she is a smuggler, so she's on the villainous side, at least like in theory. So she's probably heard of James Bond. My thing was like it's seventy one. It's not like pictures don't exist, you know. Well, it brings up the question: If she knows who James Bond is, how did Bond, after all this time, get through all these different types of uh, villainous organizations, introducing himself as James Bond? Like Blofeld is way more connected than Tiffany Cases. You would have thought that by by Doctor No, he would know who James Bond is because he's the world's most famous secret agent that everybody knows yeah. the name of you know like yeah he, yeah he's the world's worst secret agent in that he always has to introduce himself by his first and second name whenever he goes into any environment <laughs> it's like yeah it's like yeah i'm a master of espionage i'll tell you exactly who i am and you want my social security number as well my <laughs> <laughs> i do love in casino royale when he just uh, throws it out there like that, it's kind of one of the best moments of that film. But and we get a little uh, moment here where that's I, I have a note all the way skipping to the airplane. Um, I don't know if there's anything in between that you guys want to talk about, but the note that I've got yeah. next is uh, Mr. Kid says, "I must say, Miss Case is quite attractive for a for lady. a lady," and Mr. Wit glares at him. <laughs> it's a fucking stare. <laughs> Jeez. He does not like that joke. <laughs> Mr. Kid thinks it's funny. You know, he's laughing at himself, but Wentz just like, oh, fuck you, man. <laughs> like, you know, kind of... <laughs> honestly, it's uh, one of my favorite moments of the movie. This movie's garbage. So, uh, we go and we meet with another ally, Felix Leiter, one of my least favorite versions of the character, if not my least. Yeah, I didn't like this. Yeah, he's like a um, a, a mobster's patsy. <laughs> Instead of his accent and stuff like that, it's just like, yeah, yeah, boss, yeah, that, that sort of thing. It's just like that little, like more of a whiny tone to it. Don't like it. He he kind of strikes me as like um, an insurance adjuster. <laughs> like I don't buy that this dude's a CIA agent. I think that he is the manager of a like a I don't know a car dealership. You know, <laughs> but this guy's going to try to get me some kind of a, a deal and want to shake my hand with a real firm handshake or whatever. Not that he's going to have a gun. Then, then he, they follow up because um, he's looking in the um, the coffin to see where the, he asks where the diamonds are. And Bond says, elementary, my dear Felix. And this is like an example of. Did you guys do exactly what I did, which is Google the word elementary to find out what he meant? Oh, here's here's the story about this. <laughs> so I never understood this line until I looked it up however many years ago. Exactly. And for anybody yeah. who's listening, if you're as dense as I was and everybody in the world for the most part would be, what's going on here is Bond's joking about the elementary canal. You know. Just the thing that everybody knows. <laughs> oh, yeah. Exactly. They it's just like it, it just make it feel like it's such like a a really cool, smart, sophisticated line. It's just like huh, elementary, as in like the Sherlock Holmes thing. It's just like, but no one knows what that is. Mm-hmm. And they debated about this. They uh, like the writer and the director were like, we got to have this line in there. And producer Cubby Broccoli was like, nobody is going to get the joke. So when they were watching the premiere in Man's uh, Chinese Theater, a couple people. And the audience chuckled, and Cubby Broccoli apparently said, "Big deal, two doctors." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, because it's like th- that. It's way past everybody's uh, pay grade on this. Nobody gets that fucking joke. And if you do, 
you're probably right. a doctor or a nurse or something, you know? Even then, I'm sure there's a lot of, like, doctors and nurses or whatever that wouldn't get it because they would just wouldn't get, like, the wordplay at that moment. Like, that is the snootiest type of thing following up that Sherry comment, you know? Nobody would get that goddamn joke. But then, then you follow it up very soon afterwards in one of the, like, the absolute other end of the spectrum, which is Bond is sitting in the hearse <laughs> driving around with sort of thing. And he says, like, was that your brother? No, yeah, he says, says, yes, it was. He <laughs> says, oh, I have a brother. The, the stiff... <laughs> Uh, the deceased back there. Your brother, Mr. Franks? I got a brother. <laughs> my world. That is my favorite. This guy, the actor's Mark Lawrence, pops back up again. Uh, I'm trying to keep track as much as I can of the characters and the actors that pop back up. And he might be playing the same character in uh, The Man with the Golden Gun. It's not said because he doesn't have a name in this movie and in the man with the golden gun he's just Rodney he's a gangster he talks that way so it's vague enough brother. it might be like it's it's this weird stupid thing and i i i mean we're going to get to it when we get to the man with the golden gun it's only two films away but i really like Rodney in the man with the golden gun he's only in one scene but it's just like they I got a feeling they had this scene and they went, oh, I like this guy. Let's bring him back. Because he pops up again a little bit later on in Diamonds Are Forever and he has another line that's really funny and whatever. And in The Man with the Golden Gun, when we get to that, he is just kind of the same guy. So in my head canon, it's fucking Rodney right here. You know, it's just kind of, I got a brother. <laughs> it's very... That was so funny. Uh the mortician's name that runs this place, by the way, is Morton Slumber. How perfect is that? <laughs> Poor oh. Tiffany Case was that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is when you take somebody like me, who loves puns, and you go, just don't hold yourself back. Tiffany well, Case, we'll Morton Slumber. We'll get to the final one. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they burn the body, they get the diamonds out, they put it in an urn, uh, Bond swaps it for money, and Mr. Winton, Mr. Kid, knock him out, put him in a coffin, and send him into the furnace. This was genius. This is the part where you said Bond should just die, right? He should just die, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, he doesn't get out. He does not escape this. He's no. only pulled out because uh, they say that the um, that some, uh, the shady tree and... Oh, I'll, I'll get to that line. <laughs> Oh yeah, we'll talk about that later. But it's just like he Bond, like like Rob says, should die in this thing because he has no way of getting out. No, he has no gadget to cut open the thing. He has nothing that can like insulate him. He's dead. Like, for all intents and purposes, there's no way Bond gets out of this. And there's this weird music. It's not a bad track. It's just, just really like out of place. Music, isn't it? It was like funeral music, isn't it? So. That's what they play when uh, they put him into the uh, put him towards the furnace. It's just weird, and it abruptly ends with uh, the mobster Shady Tree opening the casket and saying, "You dirty double crossing limey fink, those goddamn diamonds are phonies." <laughs> One of my favorite deliveries in this entire film. It is good. <laughs> you dirty double crossing limey fink, <laughs> those goddamn diamonds are phonies. Bond's just like, yeah, they're fake, and yeah, they're fake money, and whatever. See you later, guys. I didn't like that, because it's not even like we get an explanation of, well, what the hell? He's just like, okay, cool, I'm alive. Uh, yeah, they're fake, and uh, your money's fake, and why don't you give me the real one? Uh, bye. He pulls a Randy Marsh, goes, see ya! <laughs> Any other thoughts on the uh, mortician side of things before we move on? No, let's let's let's, <laughs> nah. let's let's proceed. Let's go hang out in Vegas for a bit. Uh, do you guys ever go to Vegas? No, no. I I might be something on my to do list. I've never gone, but I don't want to go. Vegas seems awful in all oh, regards. <laughs> I mean, that's the bachelor party we're in. Uh, there's a quick shot of him looking at an ad that includes Sammy Davis Jr., who filmed a scene for this movie that was cut from the film. It's not a not a good deleted scene. It's basically Sammy Davis Jr. being Sammy Davis Jr. for the sake of it. He's like playing uh 
I don't know if it's like blackjack or something. I forget. It's been a, 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 at least a couple months since I've seen the deleted scene, but he's playing something and he just kind of says something to bond or whatever about like, you know, no, oh, you look fancy or some, some kind of joke or something. I don't fucking remember the point being it deserved to be deleted. Cause it basically was in there for people to go. I know that's Sammy Davis jr. No purpose. But we see that Shady is an old school shitty comedian with jokes like trying to find Wellard White is like finding a virgin in a maternity ward. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's quite fun. Easy to find one because there's loads of babies in there. <laughs> he uh, he's he's surrounded by two women that he calls his acorns. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hate showgirl shit. Again, I've mentioned this on other things. I just think that that's dumb to me. The idea of like, you're going to watch this old school comedian and he's going to just have these women in these flashy outfits stand next to him. I feel like it plays to the lowest common denominator where people are like, what's uh, an extra thing we can put here? Women. What's extra we can do on that flashy. You want to dangle some keys and make a baby laugh. Mm. Yeah. He's not long for this world. Mr. Went, Mr. Uh, Kid kill him a moment later. It's most annoying. Um. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, I do love the fact that like the guy goes up to says we have to keep uh tree alive. He says, well, that's really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's another deleted scene that uh thankfully they deleted because the way that they filmed that, they just sort of talk to him and shoot him, and the way that they shoot him is this just kind of like like a cap gun. Really badly filmed. It's just kind of like Pah! and he's just kind of puts his head over. Well, I bet you even that was better than some of the deaths that we actually see. Oh no, at least those are fun. This one's just sort of like you could you could get like a student film that could do a better job than this. But then we're introduced to Lana Wood's character, who inches, who introduces herself chest first as plenty. And Bond says <laughs> so you are. But of course you are. And looking at her dress. <laughs> so she clarifies she's plenty O'Toole and Bond's response arguably the best line in the entire film named after your father perhaps <laughs> <laughs> five stars amazing a joke I did not get when I was younger watching this movie <laughs> nah that's uh uh, let's, let's put it this way. If you're going to go super absurd with these Bond girls now, because that's really... That is, <laughs> um, that is the, the archetype of the Austin Powers thing. The Pussy Galore and Plenty of Tools, the thing that the Austin Powers Bond girl, or like Powers girl, whatever you want to refer to them, is like the archetype of. And like, they play craps with her, and she's like supposed to be lucky because she's a lucky lady and all that other stuff, that she's crap at the game. And then Bond yeah. just shows, oh yeah, I, I play craps all the time. It's just like... I played it once. And he just knows once. what he's doing. He, he wins. Um, he wins fifty grand out of it. Gives her a little bit, and she's just like, you know, you're a little strange or whatever, but a but a hell of a guy. Or I forget the line. Full blown gold digger, and for my money, I mean, yeah, look at her. But <laughs> uh, plenty is she has one of the best introductions, like in the entire series, because of this this whole absurdity, like. Mm-hmm. Again, Honey Child Rider. Honey Rider. Okay, you know, kind of whatever. There's nothing weird about Tatiana Romanova. You know, Tanya Romanova. Okay, it's a name. Pussy Galore, you go way blown into, you know, it's a you know, 10 scale, it's a 50. And um, nothing weird about Joel St. John. Or uh, Joel, uh, Joel Masterson. Joel St. John's the one who plays Tiffany <laughs> Case. Uh, Joel Masterson, Tilly Masterson, normal names, kind of nothing crazy about that. Domino Durval, okay, Domino, whatever. Durval, there's nothing crazy going on there. Kissy Suzuki, hmm, okay, but Aki is a totally fine name. Tracy, nothing weird. Teresa DeVincenzo, nothing weird. Plenty O'Toole and <laughs> Tiffany Case. Yep. Yeah. I mean, they might as well call I'm it a Big Titty McGee. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, they might as well have just done it. Yeah. Beautiful woman. Um, hey, that's not cool. Yeah. You can't have to be. That's the whole point. Uh, yeah. So they, they cast that well. Uh, they go to his hotel room. Mobsters are there. And Bond oh, says, I'm afraid. This, yeah, this line, you said this line. It's great. <laughs> I'm afraid you caught me with more than my hands up. 
and, and, and then they gra- they grab because um, she's already gotten her out of the dress and plenty. They grab plenty, and then they throw her out of the window oh, okay. into the pool. And Bond says like exceptional shot, and then the guy says, "I had no idea there was a pool there." <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like the line of, what is this, some kind of pervert convention? Because, <laughs> for, I mean, for her point of view, she's just like, I'm going to seduce this rich dude and try to bleed him of his money and whatever. And she goes to his, his room. She's already calling him lover. She takes her top off and it's just like, who the hell are these fucking gangsters? <laughs> Plenty uh, is, uh, she gets a rough fucking ride on this film, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah. Plenty getting tossed out of the window made me bust out laughing when I saw it in the trailer and it made me bust out laughing when I saw it here because they just fucking chuck her (laughs) arguably wouldn't it have been funnier if there wasn't a pool because imagine the consequences of that they threw this gorgeous woman out of a window and she just fucking cursed blats Like, can you imagine? Wow. And then Bond can make a quip saying, well, we're seeing plenty of tool now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Tiffany's there. And they fuck. You know. I mean, yes. yeah, she, she, I mean it, was, it was her guys or something like that. Because like, yeah. they weren't there to deal with Bond or anything like that. It's just like, okay, we're just making sure that we get rid of the gold digger so we can fuck instead. Yeah. yeah she's trying to con him out of the diamonds. And it's very obvious, too. You know, like, how about... You tell me where to pick up the diamonds, and I can get that. You know, we can go off together, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, he has I, a good tailor in Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, this leads to this whole plan. You know, did you ever go to the... When's the last time you went to the circus? They, they go to the circus thing or whatever. She's led to a water gun game. Um. Oh, there's a brief moment between there where they're trying to track where she's going and uh, they get distracted by these trapeze artists. <laughs> it's just a show off Las Vegas, whatever. But she's told with this, I, I actually kind of like it where she gets dealt this card and it's like, you know, why don't you play uh, the water balloon game? And she doesn't even bother with it. Her her gun's not pointing anywhere near, not aiming at all. And her balloon just inflates purposely and she wins. This little twerp. And this fucking kid. <laughs> Rightfully hey. complaining. Wait a minute, I saw the whole thing. The game's fixed. Who is she, your mother? <laughs> and then she says, blow up your pants? Blow up your pants. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> Hang on a sec. I mean, obviously this happens next, but the most absurd thing about this entire scene mm. is there's an elephant that wins at slots. The stupid gag with the <laughs> elephant pulling the slot machine, it gets three elephants. This movie, the the word that I have, uh, the, not the word, the note that I have there is elephant pulls slots, and then in all caps, this movie is so fucking dumb. <laughs> I missed yeah, that I just, I, with the elephant. No, I just, I just have it in my notes. An elephant wins at slots. And then it's just it's the line there. It's just like, because there's nothing else. It doesn't play any other resemblance in it. It's just, we're in the circus. Let's have an elephant win a slots machine. It's just a gag. Wouldn't this it's be not funny? Relevant, is it as well? Relevant elephant. <laughs> <laughs> and then it goes into the sideshow thing with Zambura. Uh, a woman locked in a cage that will change very slowly. As they say, <laughs> they even I mean, say it into a okay. 450 pound fucking gorilla. Yeah, I, I, again, I don't want to go too far down this thing, but I hope okay, it's the same note put, that I have. Yeah, let's put the black woman in the car. Uh-huh. She does turn into a gorilla. Just like, God oh. damn. <laughs> it's got to be a black woman. Yeah, I know. And the actual transformation bullshit is really dumb. It's a fade in, fade out type thing. Like somebody in a gorilla outfit to scare these kids. And again, I have the all, the note in all caps. This movie is so fucking dumb. Yeah. And then, so, so this, uh, Tiffany uses this opportunity to escape. And Felix basically arrives afterwards with Bond is waiting by the rental car they were supposed to get. And he says, yeah, we lost her. But good, good job there. Womp womp. And then Bond just like... Turns up like, twice. Yeah, he's first he's like, oh fuck, Felix, don't tell me you lost her. And then once he says that, he's like, okay, cool, I'm just gonna show up at her house. <laughs> yeah, completely <laughs> pointless. He's right there in the next scene. <laughs> Immediately found her. Yeah, and it's the worst thing about it is it's like he's just sitting there, there. He's just sitting there. 
like in the lounger and then you just cut over to the water and she thinks that her wig is in the pool and it's actually just plenty of tool <laughs> is like being held down by a cement block and she's drowned in the water and it's just like immediately my immediate assumption is just like okay bond decided to send a message <laughs> to her by just killing this random woman <laughs> in the pool right yeah, and he, like bond is just like oh she's dead i'm not gonna move her not gonna help her no like look that could have been you He's lounging by the pool. Plenty yeah, of tools he's... dead, drowned in the pool right next to him. And he's just like, uh, having a drink, reading a magazine. For anybody who's like keeping count, way. there's more nudity because she's wearing a white outfit in the pool. So there you go. You got your, your shot of plenty. Yeah, I really love the dead boobies. All right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but he, he justifies this saying, this, uh, write it off or whatever, as plenty must have stumbled into her place looking for Tiffany. And then they killed her thinking that it was just Tiffany. Now, in a deleted scene, they dive more into this, and they explain that Tiffany, in the deleted scene, goes to see, or uh, Plenty goes to see Tiffany because she thinks that she's intruding in on her gold digging scheme. Which it should have been in the movie. Should have been in the movie. Like, mm. absolutely should have been in the movie, because the way that it works right now, it's just sort of like, you should Never. play the water balloon thing. Ah, shove it up your uh, pants. Uh, here's an elephant. There's a gorilla woman. We lost Tiffany. Plenty's dead. And you're like, what? <laughs> Can we go back to the fucking gorilla woman? Like, that kind of thing. Like, what's happening here? What's up? And this is the point where Tiffany is no longer a smart character. She, the whole rest of the film, she is a fucking idiot. Uh, yep. And it might happen with the fact that Bond slaps her in the face. <laughs> Maybe he <laughs> slaps the intelligence out of her. You got to get the whole bond slapping the woman thing. Uh, it's yeah. just ugh, damn. Like this is this whole sequence with the. Uh, I would even excuse the water balloon because they at least have her with the uh, like not pointing the gun or whatever. Once you get to the cage, actually, no, I, I'd say once you get to the elephant, that's the point of no return for this movie. It gets even wackier and crazier, and you're like, all right, there's a lot of weird shit and a lot of bad things in this movie, but I'll forgive some of it. You get to that elephant, you get to that cage with the gorilla woman, and you're like, all right, somebody just said fuck it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, Bond slapping Tiffany, not, not great, but what can you do? it's literally just the direction they always wanted to go with the character. Uh, yeah, well, yeah I, I mean, I can't blame him in that regards because that's what Ian Fleming's Bond did. So they're just following the character at that point. I was really more put off by Bond just ignoring the dead body and letting the dead body float. So, if you think we can't go weirder from an elephant and a grill woman and a mud bath doppelganger type thing and all the other things that we've gotten so far in this movie. We go to the Tektronics place because mm -hmm. we're going to the moon. Mm -hmm. I really well, do like this one part in this though. Uh, Bond sleuths his way in by um, taking over Klaus Hergersheimer's Hergersheimer's Hergersheimer's. I forget how to pronounce it. Hergers Hergersheimer. I think it is. Uh, the reason apparently for that name is that's what uh, somebody, I think it might have been uh, Cubby Broccoli, that that was his like go to, like how people say, like the hey, Bruce Pritchard says, like a Fernum shave. It's he's just sort right. of like, it's a, it's a thingamajig. He'd be like, oh, get, get the Hergersheimer. So they just named the character Hergersheimer because they thought that'd be kind of funny. But I really like how he works his way in here. He gets to know some information about Klaus Hergersheimer is working in G section. He's checking the radiation shields, whatever. He plays it off as like, it's like, well, where's your shield? Oh, I've been waiting for you guys to give it to me. Oh, I'm sorry about that, pal. Like that kind of thing. I actually really like that. That would have worked really well in like an actual serious Bond film. Yeah, yeah I thought I... it was like really good. He was actually being a spy. It's always good to see. Yeah, but for a scientist, this guy's really dumb. Yeah, he's an idiot. Yeah. yeah. He just lets Bond in. in on the thing. And well, Bond pretends to have a little card. <laughs> That's a nice little moment. Like, but he is kind of dumb. It's um, the radiation, you know, it's not doing him too well. He didn't take a shower. He should have just washed it off. 
Right. Well, that's the thing as well. It's just like, oh, okay, Bond, uh, Sean Connery's back. Best we guess we're going right back to radiation again. That's <laughs> like the, the whole movie again. It's rockets and radiation. But if you got that little clip on, you know, then you're good. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. So he gets found out when they find it. Uh, the real Klaus pops up. You know, Bond's like, oh, I'm Klaus Hergesheimer. I'm in the G section. I'm checking the radiation shields, whatever. And then after that, and he leaves, and he's like, hi, I'm Klaus Hergesheimer. I'm from G section, checking the radiation shields. And they're like, fuck, okay. And he has to run, and he passes people filming a moon landing. Yep. And they go in slow motion to stop him. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they're going in slow motion. Like, they try and get in his way, but they're moving super. I guess they're in character, so they can't <sighs> really change that sort of fit. You don't understand. Uh, it's not the gravity. It's when you put on the suit. <laughs> <laughs> And then he gets into this ridiculous moon buggy <laughs> that, that would never, ever be taken to the moon in any circumstances whatsoever. What do you mean? Yes, it would. The size of it. <laughs> well, why not? This so, lunar rover thing is goddamn ridiculous, and the chase sucks. <laughs> yeah, because he's just like, he's driving, re- the, like, the thing's moving pretty damn slowly. And then he goes out into the desert, and every single car that's driving after him just flips itself over. <laughs> Like he doesn't do any like special maneuvers. He's just driving in a straight line, and these cars are just going over rocks and stuff like that, and just falling on their roof. You get a bunch of uh, like more agile um, ATVs, ATVs, but free re- free wheelers. They go after it, and then one of them falls off just randomly. And as he's getting on, Bond, you find out that Bond has escaped the moon buggy. He goes out, just kicks the guy off the thing, and then he drives away on the the uh, scooter. The funniest part of this entire thing is when Bond. Go, uh, catches up with um, <laughs> Tiffany again and he just like he clearly Sean Connery's never ridden a bike before <laughs> because he just lets it go and he almost falls like arse over tea kettle or whatever you want to call it just like <laughs> just like, like he, yeah he just nearly falls flat on his face trying to get off this thing gets back in the car drives off and it's like I mean I don't know if you guys want to talk a little bit more about the moon buggy but it's just like it's just a ridiculous scene <laughs> It's awful. It's absolutely awful. And it's like, what the fuck is this doing in the movie? Are you, they literally just like had these ideas of wouldn't it be fun or funny if, and then they were like, just do it all. Moon buggy, car chase, whatever. Like, just do them. And we get a proper car chase afterward. Thankfully, it's much better. Yeah, through through Las Vegas. But again, it's just. Okay, or at least like Bond's causing it this time. But essentially, this entire chase is like saying the entire Los Angeles, not, not Los Angeles, the entire Las Vegas Police Department are a bunch of dolts who just can't help but just drive into each other in every single possibility or drive into a bunch of parked cars. That's a running theme in this franchise is when he's in America, the police are idiots. I guess that's fair. We're going to get into it with uh, If You Do a Kill. We're going to get into it a little bit with Live and Let Die. You may have the Golden oh, Gun type stuff. On. What is that then? suggesting that america fake the moon landing <laughs> and just like being like yeah fuck you it's fake <laughs> probably well, okay let's get to the next absurd thing in this movie which is as far as we know this is just a pl- plain normal muscle car that they're driving around in and yet bond somehow manages to flip it onto two wheels <laughs> drive it on its side and then to turn it while it's on one side <laughs> into the other side <laughs> in this like little small corridor, the fucking sheriff tries to do the same thing immediately flips it over because, funny enough, cars work that way. But Bond somehow has like, again, he has a magic penis. He also has magic driving skills. It's like he's got magic hands that can control cars in ways that <laughs> most normal human beings couldn't. He's got two magic stick shifts. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. <laughs> and the funny thing about this whole thing is Tiffany's face during the entire trace thing. It's just like she's just like just staring mouth agape at this entire. Oh, yeah, she's, she's completely ineffective. More on that when we get to the ending. So this whole stunt, the big stunt of the film, you know, the going on the two wheels, mm-hmm. squeezing into this dead end corridor. They try to fix this thing because they come out on the alley on the opposite end because they filmed it in two separate shots and they didn't realize it until afterward. They go, you know, they start with uh, him leaning on the right. He comes back and leaning on the left. Their idea of how to make that work was to do an insert shot of the car flipping to the other side. Absolutely impossible because there's no way you can flip that car in the alley. That's the whole point. 
Oh no! What happened was that there's like there's a little there's a little wider opening in that one little section where the car does flip <laughs> over onto the other side, <laughs> and has and another little ramp. Yeah, it's yeah. so dumb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the cars in this movie were all provided uh, provided by Ford because Ford was like, "We want Bond to drive our car in the next film, and we'll give you that car and any car you want to destroy." As long as he's driving our, you know, the red car and uh, the Mustang. And uh, they were pretty much like, that helps out the budget. Cool. Yeah. But man, this it's people talk about this being like one of these great car chase things. There are so many better car chases in this franchise that don't have a dumb thing like that alley insert shot, whatever. You've already seen them. But the. uh, the car didn't explode. Right. It's one thing. <laughs> Is that positive or a negative? I guess it's more of a well, negative. American cars are just built better, clearly. Yeah, I mean, the uh, if the um, cop car that flipped over, if that would have been a villain's car, it would have blown up mid-flip. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a thing, like... In this movie, this has absurd as this movie is. It's just like, no, it can't the cars blowing up. That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> So Bond and Tiffany are off to the honeymoon suite in the White House, spelled W-H-Y-T-E, on a bed that's made out of glass with fish in it? Yeah, they have sex on top of a fish tank, I wrote. The, how the fuck is that comfortable? It's um, glass. Like, they're laying on glass. Awful. Yeah, but he's, but he's I, Bond. I mean, her surname is Kais. <laughs> <laughs> Bond uses this grapple hook thing this, uh, to get up to the higher floor. I'm thinking to myself, nope, 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 nope. Not not ever doing that. Nope. No heights guy. <laughs> not like that, at the very least. Um, and he lands on a toilet uh, when he gets inside with all these video monitors over it. Because we're going, if you haven't figured it out already, we're going with Willard Whitey and Howard Hughes. Because haha. And instead, it's Blofeld. But it's two Blofelds. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and one of them is on the phone with this Tektronix voice box stuff that apparently also changes the voice of someone in the room. <laughs> you can change it to a southern accent. <laughs> to Will or Why here, that kind of thing. Uh, he does say that the, what, the other one has a miniature voice box embedded in his neck, so and maybe you can justify it that way, but his voice is naturally dubbed by... You want to guess? It can't be her, surely. <laughs> it's not Nikki. Nikki it... Vanderzil. No. Nah. Really? No, of course. It's Willard White. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dubbing thing. I had to get in there. I don't think she pops up in the rest of the franchise at this point. No. Uh, she might. She was a good seven. Uh, she was a good seven. Uh, um, Bond is trying to figure out how to kill one of them or both of them. Oh, he figures it out. Uh, he's point. Yeah, figuring out the point. Of this uh, little statue type thing. Of course he kills the double. Which is pretty obvious. And he kills him by kicking the cat toward the guy. And shooting him in the head. And he says he got the wrong one. Not by saying like. Oh man I got the wrong blow photo ever. He says. Wrong, wrong pussy. pussy. <laughs> Come on. I get- uh, <laughs> uh, okay, okay so. We got that line out of the way. Unfortunately. But then I'm just there, staring at the, like, sc- staring like internally screaming at the screen now. Fucking shoot, shoot him! <laughs> yeah, just shoot the real Blofeld at that point. You no, know, like, no, I'm sharing a Blofeld. Shoot James Bond. What the fuck are you doing? Oh, same thing with that too. Yeah, at this point, the, no, you've tried to kill Bond how many times? Shoot Bond. Yeah. Yeah. Just like rather than kill him immediately, Blofeld decides, "Hey, go into this elevator instead." Oh, he goes in the elevator, gets gassed. Shouldn't have pressed L for lobby. That was his uh his issue. Mm. That's dumb because you got to do that, and then you got to get a shot where Mister Went, Mister Kid put Bond in the trunk of a car. Uh, a bottle of cologne falls out. It's like one of the most important parts of the movie, which is absurd. Yeah. And no, for... well, I, when I first saw it, I thought like, okay, so Bond's gonna land this cologne, and then that's gonna wake him up while he's in the trunk. Mm-hmm. So he can fight them off and deal with them, but he doesn't wake up. 
Or he's gonna like use that, that to start a fire somewhere or like yeah. You have to you have to hold on to that little nugget of information to <laughs> right at the very end of the movie. And by that point, I, I would assume ninety percent of the audience had completely forgotten what they were talking about. And it's a quick enough insert shot that you might not have even seen it to begin with. Yeah, exactly. And like they put him in there and his by putting him in here, he shatters the bottle. So I mean he should have gotten cut, but whatever. Mm. And instead of cl- uh, killing Bond, they put him in this construction tube so that hours later, while he's still unconscious, so by the way, totally brain dead, you know, mm. uh, they like bury him and there's this rat and he goes, one of us smells like a tart's handkerchief. I'm afraid it's me. Sorry about that, old boy. I enjoyed that. I must admit, I don't know why <laughs> I enjoyed him talking to the rat. Like, I'm sorry. I said you smell. I mean, it's, 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 it, it's, it's funnier after that because after Bond manages to get his way past this this little machine which is going through all the tunnels and by short circuiting it, he just like climbs out. They like, the um, maintenance men go down to like repair the machine. He comes out the hatch and says like, oh, "I'm sorry, I was uh, I was uh, uh, walking my uh, pet rat and I uh, think I've got lost my way." <laughs> Again, I've got the all caps. This movie is so dumb. <laughs> yeah. So to yeah, in response to that, with a little bit of Q's help, they do their own voice modulator and they impersonate Bert Saxby and set up a whole bunch of stuff. Um, Where did Good Q gadget. come from? Where did Q come from? Because yeah, Q wasn't in America. Came from England. Before. Yeah, no, no, I know. <laughs> but like, there's no like. Yeah, there's, there's no, no shot of like calling him up. Like, he, yeah, he's just like there. He's just like now in America now. Yeah, he just hangs out for the rest of the movie, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's just playing spots. He just enjoyed himself. Here's another part of the film that I absolutely hate. Uh, Bond and company, they go to White's penthouse. And Bond's met with Bambi and Thumper. Do you hate the names or do you just hate the scene? I hate every single aspect of this. The yeah, women this is... are terrible actresses. They're good gymnasts. Well, yeah, that's what, I think that's what their role was. To be. Uh, we're choosing you because you're athletic and you look pretty strong rather than you actually can act. It's a ridiculous concept. A silly Go, fight Bambi. scene. Go, Thumper. <laughs> yeah, you're up now, Bambi. And all this. Like, uh, there, there were not. They weren't very good at their acting jobs but go ahead no i was gonna say that there's this one part where uh i think it's uh which one which one's bambi is that the uh the... bambi's the white one okay so yeah so bambi's got her her legs wrapped around bond's neck yeah from above and then there's just like these like it cuts away <laughs> and cuts back three or four times between just thumper just like gyrating or yeah something. <laughs> the fuck is she doing she's doing this posing shit and there's trapeze nonsense and she's just she's going out of her way to like kick the air yeah which is just like it's an incredible scene in the regards to like these two women just beat the shit out of bond just like yeah. kick him all over the place they kick him into the pool and then and then bond while in the pool they tend to drown him and bond just gets his hands up he puts him <laughs> in the back of the heads and drowns them and drowns them, or doesn't drown them obviously just puts their heads underwater and basically just controls the entire thing from there it's like they're kryptonite or something they get into the water they decide to go into the water by the way they push him into the water and they jump in and do it fucking dive because why would you need to do like perfect dive like that instead of jumping on the guy or whatever what? and as soon I, as I they get in know. there it's just pretty much like all right i'm just gonna grab your heads and shove you down and shrug I got this uh, kind of figured out, you know. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen a um, like a deer and a rabbit in the middle of an ocean or a, <laughs> in a lake or something like that. They, they, they don't they don't work too well in those in those situations. So I had to Google whether or not Charlie's Angels was already on the air, and that's why they had this scene of two women just completely beating the shit out of James Bond. Because at this point, we've learned that these two women. And the two henchmen are, like, the biggest threat Bond has ever faced. Because they keep kicking his ass. And then they get in the water and it's like, ah, we're done with that. But my favorite shot of them is when they're walking towards Bond and they're like, I I don't know what they're doing, if they're trying to dance towards them (laughs) or what. But it's just, like, the least threatening faces I have ever seen. That's, I don't know. Great scene, just for how absurd it is. But 
not a great Bond scene. I don't know how they're going to rank when we're done with this series, but I'll tell you right now, Bambi and Thumper are my least favorite women in the entire franchise at this point. Oh, I, I didn't dislike them that much. I thought they were actually a fun novelty act. Like, they I did think well. it's absurdly stupid. <laughs> It, it wouldn't have been as bad if they wouldn't have been named Bambi and Thumper or they wouldn't have been doing these weird gyration things or they wouldn't have been trapeze things or whatever. Because it's like, these are his bodyguards? And like, they beat the shit out of Bond, sure. But like, who the fuck is like hiring a bodyguard? And, you know, um, Goldfinger is like, give me this big hulking wrestler for odd job. And you got like Hans and you only live twice. And it's like, okay, this dude's like this big kind of guy. And Willard White, this jackass is like, uh, give me these trapeze women that are just kind of lounging out on a rock while I'm like held captive, kind of. Ugh. I mean, he's Howard Hughes, like you said. Absolutely yeah, I, stupid. I think that that's fine because he's like, it's, you don't expect it. And hey, once they're done kicking the shit out of James Bond, he can have fun with them. At least that's the assumption you get. <laughs> Uh, Bambi and Thumper. And fi- Felix has a line. He goes, Willard White's about to be executed, and guess who's giving brushstroke lessons? <laughs> I do like that. It's just kind of like, there you go. And Willard White is played by Jimmy Dean, you know, the sausage guy. <laughs> the fuck is this movie? America. But then they're just like, so, so they get out of the thing, and he's like, convinces like white to leave or whatever and stuff like that and then Saxby's there we barely even mentioned him throughout the entire thing he's there just he's got a sniper rifle and just starts shooting at him and then they just shoot him just falls down the hill <laughs> just rolls down ah! and, and, then white says he's, and then white says he's fired yeah tell him he's fired <laughs> uh, god and I, I love that like so much. It's, it's doing a really low opinion for like American like 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 brain power at this point. I don't even care yeah. if they're making fun of Americans. I just it's bad. <laughs> like, you know? I I think that it's funny that on the commentary they're like, I think that this is like the funniest of the Bond films or whatever. It's like, well, you wrote this shit. Like you, you made it silly, you know? Like so Q's rigged up this machine to control slot machines. He doesn't even care about grabbing the money. I think it's a fun little moment. I love it. Uh he's just sort of like I put a little bit of pressure on here and it's whatever. And you can, you know, he very easily puts his hand up, pulls the slot, wins, puts his hand up, pulls the slot machine, wins. Actually, it's one of my favorite parts of the whole uh, uh, movie. And it happens to be followed up by one of my least favorite parts in the entire franchise. <laughs> Tiffany is shoved into a cab and there's Blofeld dressed in drag as an old woman petting his cat. Why not? Throw some drag See, in there. Is... See, this is very carry on now. <laughs> I have to show you some of the carry on clips because you would just say, oh, yeah, this is very much it. Who are misses? <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, really bad. No um, excuse. So, and so, like, now, we've got, now we see this um, satellite that's launched under quote unquote white's orders, but it opens up prematurely. <laughs> and now they and now uh, Blofeld's got control of it. Then he just destroys a missile in North Dakota, and then destroys a a submarine in Russia, I assume. North Korea. Yeah, 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 and yeah, destroys like other missiles in like North Korea with a guy that's on fire. Yeah, terrible VFX shot. Yeah, it's, the missiles like turn red, and the guy just walks into f- the frame on fire. It's atrocious. And White White reveals what Blofeld's uh, big plan is, which is like the laser is being put up for auction, and the winner gets like nuclear supremacy by destroying all the other people's missiles using it. And you got to use then, diamonds to do refraction and all this, yeah. so you had to get the diamonds to be a part of that, which seems like it's this convoluted ass way of throwing diamonds into the mix. Yeah, and and Bond like somehow immediately figures out that he's in Baja, California. <laughs> he doesn't figure it out just immediately like that. He goes, oh, you could be here or there or there or there or there or there, mentioning Baja. And uh, Jimmy Dean's, uh, I love his the way that he delivers it. Baja? I don't have a place in Baja. <laughs> it's like... Just the way that Bond mentions it. It's just like, he mentions just like loads of actually pretty prominent 
either states or cities. And then he says Baja California. It's like, who ever heard of Baja California? (laughs) There's a couple lines in the, this uh, franchise that stick with me that make like, why would it stick with me? One of you, one of them being from Dr. No, the W six N W six N that kind of thing. Baja is one of them. (laughs) Just Baja. I cannot ever think of Baja in any capacity for the rest of my life without thinking of Willard White yelling that it's going to be, burned in my brain forever yeah they're on the oil rig it's like okay let's just get into the end of the movie kind of a thing because we had enough wacky hijinks and uh, the next interesting element i have written down is all the way later on with uh switching the tape so i don't know if you guys have any other notes <laughs> I, I i'm gonna have to fill in a few of the gaps here so bond gets dropped down in some sort of inflatable ball <laughs> and so he's dropped in the war there and he gets to the base and he just immediately gives himself up yeah um, you see Tiffany is just laying on this oil rig in a bikini. Which looks great. <laughs> she does. Again, not denying it. It's just like, it seems like a pretty <laughs> odd place to be doing some sunbathing right now. And yeah, actually this is when he gets to the tape part of it. So I'll pass <laughs> it back to you then. He wants to try to replace the tape with the marches of whatever it was. And uh, he swaps it. And later on, Tiffany... Swatch, uh, switches the real tape back <laughs> and Bond I think he calls her uh, an ignorant twit or something you, you twit you switch <laughs> you put the real one back in there and I was like she's so bad yeah. well it's just like it's all just a massive farce because like they they trade tapes right in front of Blofeld mm-hmm. there's no attention whatsoever to it and then Bond slips the tape into her trunks Says, oh, your problems are all behind you now. Good line. And then she decides, because <laughs> she's an idiot, to swap the tapes back over. So now she's not even just like a nothing, an, an, a, like a non-entity. She's now actively working against Bond, yeah. and not, not intending to do it. I do and like so... when Bond just goes, bitch. <laughs> it's, just like, yeah. like, <laughs> it's like they didn't want to try to think like a, you know, a, a pithy line or something. He's just like, well, what, what could he say to really show that he, you know, thinks that she's a bitch right now? I don't know. How about bitch? <laughs> But no, the thing I just love about it, what I love about it and hate about it at the same time, is just that Bond just says like, "Oh, it's the tape's right here." It's just like it's just so easy. Just like he just like knocks the button and the tape goes flying out, and Blofeld just says, "Put it back." Yeah, it's like he's, a, it's like, he's like a like a five year old or something like yeah. that. He just knocks something off. The, like fucking shoot the guy. He's just gonna be an irritant to you. And Bond, when he gets out and he's being like held up by guards and stuff like that, he just lets off a red balloon. Just to let him know that like this is where the base is and stuff like that, and he tries to run away. They still won't kill him. They'll put mm. him in a room which has a completely accessible hatch that Bond can escape out of. <laughs> just at just this a point, comedy of errors. It's like ridiculous at this point. Bond's the guy that took out your plot with Doctor No. Bond's the guy that undid this whole thing with Kronstein. That was just this like impossible to fail plot. You might not have ties to Goldfinger, but you might have heard about the Goldfinger plot, and you know that Bond was a part of that because you you got your you know your fingers and all these different kind of pies. He foils your plot with Thunderball. You were standing in the same room with him, and you had a gun trained on him, and you only lived twice, and whatever. And you've seen that this guy, in multiple circumstances, can try to get himself out of a circum uh, some kind of a plot by doing things like having trick cigarette guns. And he also infiltrated your fucking allergy base. And you're like, put the tape back. You don't think that that fucker did something? <laughs> Shoot the bastard, move along with your plot, you're fine. And instead, we get a whole thing where Tiffany tries to swap the case back or whatever, and Blofeld notices the tape in her bikini, and he says she's showing more cheek than usual, and he compliments her ass cheeks and says, it's a pity that they aren't brains. Remember how an hour ago this woman had more IQ points? <laughs> yeah, no, I forgot. It right out. <laughs> which which makes it all the more worse. And honestly, she's at the very bottom of my Bond girl tier. She fucking sucks. And they want to follow that up with a scene where she shoots a rifle and she bounces off the oil platform. That's that. I mean, that is funny. I mean, if, like if you're if if you're at this point, you've just given up on taking her seriously. That's funny. 
She's just like, ah! Like, so, like, Bond is saying, like, shoot, shoot, shoot them and stuff like that. And so they get shot by the helicopters in the sky because all the Ally helicopters are in there now. And so she just fires a gun. The recoil just sends her flying backwards. And and Bond's ingenious plan now because obviously the tape thing isn't work. He's just going to use Blofeld <laughs> in his own submarine to destroy the control center with his own submarine. Just smash it to... <laughs> I do like the little bit where it's like, we should get out of here. And he's just like, absolutely not. And then as soon as like I leaves, he's like, yeah, prepare my submarine. I'm going to leave. Yeah. And yeah, just like, so then he gets him out of the water. He plays around with him a little bit by dropping it in the water and then lifting him back up. And then he just slams him repeatedly into the control center. Seemingly Blofeld dies doing this. We don't get to see it really. So that's again, it's, it's an unsatisfying way to have Blofeld, the guy that killed Bond's wife, love of his life in the previous movie just die yeah in the like it'll be right this is your uh this is your payoff for Bluefield killing tracy is him smashing that in there while the uh happy little uh 007 action theme plays that because it's like it's uh it's super happy and we're having this adventure it's like this guy murdered your wife <laughs> why are you just smashing this someone else like God, it's they. It's almost like they purposely add that action theme in there just to like annoy the shit out of me to being like this is an absolute farce. Like you're saying, it, it's so dumb. There's no shot of Blofeld's death or anything. The oil rig explodes. It just cuts to Bond and Tracy on a cruise ship. Yeah, <laughs> with uh, with Wint and Kid <laughs> looking out the portholes. Yeah, they're uh, they're there. They're pretending to be the wait staff. They got all this food, courtesy of Willard White, including what apparently looks delicious for dessert. Bomb Surprise. A literal ticking bomb inside of a fake cake. Yep. And Yeah, so so Tiffany's like immediately just sitting down, ready to go. Like yeah. she has no idea about what yeah. this could potentially be. She's a fucking idiot at this point, so she's just like, ooh, I can I can deal with that. I love that it's ticking. Like I can yeah. uh okay. Bond sees through the act, and you know, he's not a moron, and it's all because of the aftershave. Well, it's two things. So it's the no, aftershave, side first of, the of thing, all. Yeah. And it's this fact that says that he thinks that he would have preferred a claret. And then the guy doesn't have, says, like, oh, well, clarets, or we don't have any clarets on board, and stuff like that. So it's like, oh, this wine actually is a claret. So you guys have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and then it's just like, all right, I guess we're going to start fighting each other. And Mr. Kid just grabs some flaming, uh, Shit, and it goes hold right on, in his face. Hold on, hold on, no. They start choking Bond. And fucking every movie, the woman helps a little bit. Tanya she shoots looks- Rosa Klebb. <laughs> uh, Domino kills Emilio Largo. Kissy doesn't really do anything, but she's in the fight scene, you know. The, this completely fucking incompetent woman is just like... Oh, wow. I guess we're not having dinner. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, where, when can we uh, eat that bomb surprise? <laughs> she watches him. Yeah, she just watches. She's just sitting there, like, gasping and stuff like that. So, oh. And then he walks forward slowly with flaming skewers. Bond yeah. just throws some of the alcohol over him and sets a uh, uh, kid aflame. Yep. Kid just falls off the side. And when he lands, he's like a skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> just like, that's just immediately happened. And then, like, Tiffany at least does something that's somewhat worthwhile in that she throws the bomb trying to hit Kid, misses, but then reveals the bomb's there. Like, that's her go to thing like, is that she, I'm going to help out now that one of the guys is already, you know, it's not a two on one anymore. Now I'll help out. I know what I'll do. I'll throw the... the guy or something. Like, she decides to throw the goddamn cake. <laughs> And the bomb, and then the bomb thing happens. Bond grabs him. He wedges this between uh, his legs. The bomb's strapped to him. He flips him over the boat, and Mr. Wynn explodes. And Bond <laughs> says, well, he certainly left with his tail between his legs. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it- and then the final like line of this entire movie is Tiffany asking <laughs> how they're going to get the diamonds out of the satellite in the sky. And that's just like, so how are we going to get those diamonds back? Diamonds are forever. That's your payoff for killing uh, Tracy. Because <laughs> we're not going to see Blofeld again for six movies. And when we see him, it 
It's even worse. Oh my god. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, that's one to look forward to. I know, <laughs> so, so that's the penultimate Blofeld, the one that we're going to see, because the one off that is the one yeah, the Spectre. Yeah, reboot type of scenario. Because yeah. the reason that they didn't use Blofeld after this point is this is full-blown lawsuit of that whole thing with Thunderball. So they're like, you know, well, we can't use Blofeld going forward. So I don't know if they purposely put Blofeld in here to try to cram it in there before the lawsuit would kick in or or what. Like, but I mean, I think this is the first time they say at the end what specifically the next Bond film is going to be because it says James Bond will return in Live and Let Die. Oh, no, they they used that in the end of. Um, They've been doing that. They yeah, did they, that did that, they did that at the end of. Uh, um, uh, old. Service? Uh, you only live twice. No, oh, you only live twice. Okay. Bond will return in uh, Her Majesty's Secret Service. Okay. So, like, I will say, I mean, Living the Thigh has got some moments. <laughs> and, like, that's the one that takes place in Harlem. And there's some funny stuff in there. But it is significantly less crazy than this movie is. It's actually a better, better film in a lot of ways. And it's just like, I hate Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> It's not a good movie. I mean, absolutely awful. It's absolutely batshit crazy. And there's um, there is some element of charm and enjoyment out of that, but it's something that you'd only get really charm and enjoyment if you're just taking it as if, okay, so this is not a parody Bond movie, but like, okay, this is the weird one. So yeah, that's that's all you can really do with it, really. I I hated I I wanted to love this. I thought I was going to love this. When I watched the trailer, I thought, oh, man, this will just be so crazy, and I'll just love it. I hate this movie. <laughs> yeah. I think that... Has Dr. Night been beaten? And, uh, fuck, that's a bad one, too, though. Uh, well, where, does, uh, just, uh, where does On Her Majesty's Secret Service land for you? Because I don't have that on my, uh, my, my notes here. Under a Thunderball? Yeah. All right, let me move that into my little notes here. Where's Diamonds on your list, then? It's under From to a Love, but still above Dr. No. I'm not going to let Dr. No slide this, probably, because it's like e- even this movie is a little bit better put together, but that might just be a time thing. I We breathed right over it, but like they got away from a lot of the tropes with these two guys until they fucking did the very end with <laughs> the way he was like, ooh! Yeah. <laughs> Bond is strapping the fucking bomb to him. And I just, like, what the fuck? It's like, how what? do we kill these characters that have been killing lots of people? I don't know. Let's work a taint in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's... I hate it. And the worst Bond girl, I hope they don't get any worse than this, because the... The worst. They do. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it right now. Uh, like, uh, you're not gonna like um, Mary Goodnight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this uh, movie blows. <laughs> it's it's yeah. a fucking romp. Like, if the way that you like the Bond franchise is that you like the silly humor and the stupid, you know, impossible that nobody would name their kid that type of stuff. It's funny. With like pussy galore and plenty of tool and all that. If you like hokey camp, then uh, some people love this movie. It's like their favorite of the franchise. And for somebody like me, where I'm like, my three favorites are golden eye license to kill and casino Royale. <laughs> They're like the, arguably the three, most serious Bond films. Uh, not at all uh, working in the same relation with that. Yeah. It's just... Yeah. I, I can't... Fuck this film. <laughs> Best part of it, you can see in the trailer, and it's plenty being chucked out of a window. <laughs> so let's recap a little bit here. Allies, we've got... Uh, one scene of Money Penny, not her best scene, but she's Money Penny, so I still love her. Yeah, I think, yeah, Money Penny's great as usual, but I think overall, like 
N is surlier than ever. Yeah, he's um, a pain in the ass in this one. Uh, like Q's not super involved can... in it. What was that, Rob? <laughs> I think we lost you there. I think uh, I think this this uh, this movie broke Rob's brain, <laughs> or at least his, at, the very at least his internet connection. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I pick up this, like a little bit with like this thing that just, Q was. I mean, Q had a bit more exposure in this movie than maybe in the previous one. It's not. It wasn't great by any stretch of imagination. Felix sucks. Felix well, sucks. Felix. Yeah, he was completely ineffective until the the final fighting scene as well. But I like yeah. Q in it though. Yeah, I mean it's not it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's just not. Um, I, I don't think the um, I don't think the allies overall were a positive on this one. So how are you thinking about MQ, Money Penny, uh, and Felix, Rob? Now that we got you back in the mix, uh, Money Penny, not our best scene. Very. Very bland. They weren't even in the shot together. M, I'm going to say, wasn't even a ally. He was very contentious <laughs> towards Bond here. Q is fun as ever, and he seemed to even have a little more fun in this one just because he wasn't always, here's the gadgets. And Felix, nah, not a great take on the character. I'm actually going to go thumbs down for the allies. I forgot to mention this about Money Penny. It's weird that she has more chemistry with uh, Connery in this scene than she did in You Only Live Twice, because they're not even filming together and they still had better chemistry. Well, that's how that's probably the benefit, yeah. Yeah. Um, the gadgets we got the moon buggy thing. Thumbs yeah. down. <laughs> Are we yeah. counting that as a gadget? I, yeah, kind of. Got the mouse trap. That's the thumbs down. Yeah. Uh, we got the grapple hook. Thumbs that up. Works. Yeah, that works. I like the yeah. fake fingerprints. That's good. Thumbs up. Yeah, fake fingerprint was good. Um, Q's little gadget to help him win its slot. Thumbs I up. like that. That's cool. It's a fun little. I like when they give Q like more and more throughout this series. They make Q have fun, and sometimes the gags are a little bit stupid to the point where it's like, oh come on, they never would do that. This is a fun little gadget. It's like, you know, why wouldn't he just... Because he says, I've been dying to test it out. So it's something that he just did on his own. It's not like they actually have, like, a fundamental purpose to it. I mean, they might, though. You know, like, Bond being a part of uh, these casinos all the time, like, maybe he would need to get, like, a quick bit of cash or something. About the um, voice modulator. Dumb. <laughs> really, like why here? I liked it. I mean, that is a real piece of technology that exists today. Yeah. No, the execution's what's dumb about it. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. Like, how does that work when you're standing in the room with somebody? You know? Oh, and I love that Bond, by the way. I forgot to mention on the other uh, voice scene where he's like, you know, if he's as much of a genius as they say or whatever it was, like, touting himself as being this brilliant dude. Overall, I'm going to (sighs) say... Thumbs down for the gadgets. It's not as bad as, uh, like, on Her Majesty's Secret Service not having anything other than that safe-cracking thing, but... I mean, I don't know. I mean, I like the fake fingerprints. I'm gonna say thumbs up because the fake fingerprints and the voice modifier, they actually do work. The slot machine thing was fun, and Q was fun, yeah. which I'm gonna throw into the gadgets here because he... When they touted the voice modifier, he's like, oh, it's no big deal. I gave one to these kids for Christmas because, you know, this is easy. I just like that quip. So I'll give it a thumbs up. Yeah, I'd say overall Gadget's thumbs up. It's an improvement on the previous movie. And I mean, say what you will about the mouse trap being dumb. At least it was effective. <laughs> True. On the uh, the villain side of things, we've got Peter Franks and Mr. whatever he was, I forget his name, and Burt Saxby and a bunch of people that we don't really even need to get too much into. Um, they're not really all that good. The Franks uh, fight scene is good. Well, you know, when we talk about action. Yeah, fantastic fight scene. Uh, villains, thumbs down. This sucked. <laughs> yeah, Blofeld is obviously the main villain. I think he was played way too, way too campy and way too... Um, yeah, just a bit too laissez-faire rather than being like an actual intimidating villain. And like the thing with um, uh, 
Kid and um, Win. Uh, kid, kid, yeah, Kid and Win. It's just, it's just weird names. Like, kid and Win is just that they were just too. They just don't look the part, even though they were doing stuff that was the part. I just don't see. I just don't see what the the vision was. Is like, okay, we're gonna have these two just ran sack for everyone, but we have to make sure that they don't look intimidating in the slightest, and they're homosexual as well. Yeah. And nobody talks to anybody like that. I'm sorry, like the, nobody is like, oh, that's a good one, Mister Win. It's like, nobody, no one does that. Try and try again, Mister Kid. <laughs> you know, whatever. I gotta say though, honestly, I'm giving a thumb up to a certain extent. For Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid, because they're good and comp- because they did their job well. It's just that they're weird characters. They do their job really well, and they're they're memorable, infamously or not. I do love the theme. Like if we get into the music side of things, I love their theme, and it's like I don't know. Everybody kind of has like a gimmick, and they decided for some reason the gimmick for this one would be gay, which is not like it shouldn't be a gimmick, but you know whatever. They're clearly in this movie. Like, this movie's absurd. It's ridiculous. It's silly. It's stupid. And I hate it. And in this movie, they're one of the most charming kind of elements. Fair. Like, I am by no means ranking Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid on the par with, like, Boris and Xenia from GoldenEye or, uh, odd job or whatever but i'm like oh, i love mr Wynn, mr kid they're stupid you know <laughs> like at least i can play off them being like silly characters more than i can blofeld because blofeld's like you just ruined blofeld by this point he is so cool as just the voice that's instructing uh oh god what's the same uh morzany or, or i think to kill kronstein in from russia with love like that's a completely different Blofeld. So major thumbs down on the villains on this one. Yeah. Sorry, Mrs. Whistler. <laughs> I forgot to mention of the allies, Willard White. Thumbs down on Willard White. I liked him. I mean, he was just... just I, I can't class him as, a, as a, an ally, really, because he was the one that f- was facilitating the villains in the first place. Obviously, not of his own accord, but, you know. But... Yeah, he's just, he's just he's just there, like, because he's not really helping Bonnie. He's just like a rich dude that just wants to get this shit done with. He does tell him that if he wants to have the cruise ship go around a couple times, he'll yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, the girls, we got Marie, the one who gets her top taken off. She's nothing, of course. Mm-hmm. We got a uh, Zambora, <laughs> gorilla woman, uh, Bambi and Thumper. I already said it. Massive thumbs down for Bambi and Thumper for me. What's wild to me is they're the only women in this movie I would give thumbs up. Yeah, I think I'd give them a thumbs up as well. I just they're terrible actresses, but they make their scene. That scene is memorable. Your turn, Bambi. <laughs> Plenty of tool. I give her a thumbs up, honestly, because her character is a gimmick. Yeah, it's a it's a gold digger gimmick and she dies. I'm like, all right, well, she's a gold digger and she's hot and she dies. Like, all right. Fair. She serves her purpose. Unceremoniously written off. They should have had that deleted scene. But like, you know, it's to me, Plenty of Tool is in that same sort of uh range as like Pat Fearing from Thunderball, the um uh God, what do you call it? The She's not a physician. Um, just a. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know. What you're uh, yeah, I can't like think of the word. Sort of like, but yeah, it was some. All I can of, think of is like, obstetrician. Like, and not... like some sort of clinician or something like that. Or health, yeah, like health worker, or whatever. You know, like I can't Working ding uh, plenty of tool too much in comparison to like uh, Ruby Bartlett or uh, Miss Taro. You know. Sylvia Trench. She's in that kind of range. Tiffany, though, damn it, Tiffany. If you if she stayed where she was before the Gorilla Woman, major thumbs up. Everything from Gorilla Woman onward, major thumbs down. Yep. 
Tiffany's a big thumbs Major down. Thumbs down. Awful. On the music side of things, we already kind of said this. Um, I love the Mr. Went Mr. Kid theme, and I love Diamonds Are Forever, so I can't possibly give this more than a thumbs up. Music yeah. is a thumbs up. Yeah, music is a thumbs up, for, especially for the Diamonds Are Forever thing. I also quite, quite like the fact that, well, I actually find it quite odd, but in retrospect, kind of like the fact that there are a lot of scenes or fight scenes stuff where there's no music play. Yeah. At all. I think you would have thought like, like the car chase would have been the Bond theme blasting or something, yeah. Yeah, but no, they just like just let the the sounds do the thing for it. So I'm kind of okay with that. On the uh, the action and the humor, um, the action's pretty ridiculous. Sometimes it's good. Uh, sometimes it's bad. Mostly kind of bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the fight with Franks is the best part of the action side of it. The car chases, I think, are a little bit too over the top and a bit too ridiculous for me. Yeah, um, the fight in the elevator makes this stand out, but overall I'd probably say bad just because even like the movements in all of them were bad. And how do we classify the humor on this? Because... Right, you know. <laughs> it's good humor. The whole thing is comedy. Yeah, because it is ridiculous and it is a farce and he, he does come up with some Listen, the lines are funny. That's way, way, way too over the line in certain places, but I can't deny the fact that this makes me laugh on occasion. Damn it, he says wrong pussy. Like, what? <laughs> uh, I, I guess if uh, if what you're going for is the silliest Bond film, this is as much of a thumbs up as you can get, because it is. But if you're going for, like, what would I write for a Bond film, this is not at all what I would write for a Bond film. So I no, it's, not sophist- it's not sophisticated enough at all. No. Uh, I, I love humor in the Bond films. This is when you get into somebody who thinks that, that that's the primary element. That's just wrong. <laughs> uh, so shaken, not stirred. Uh, <laughs> I think we know where we're going here. As shaken as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's let's turn this down the plug hole. Full yeah. on, uh, putting it in one of those paint mixer type things that shakes it like crazy. I, mean, I, I do appreciate the fact that like we've all got when we're just looking at the master list and things like that, we've all got kind of things a bit all over the place, really. But then we just see Diamonds of Forever is Tony's worst one, Rob more of a mind second worst one. So yeah, it's yeah. like <laughs> there's a free consensus here of like, yeah, this movie sucks. I yeah, really thought uh, I was gonna like it. You thought you were going to be like, this is so silly that it's the best thing in the world. Yeah. Instead of that, this is so silly. God damn, this is stupid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For anybody who's keeping track, this is our rankings right now. Rob's got Goldfinger at number one, then From Rush With Love, Thunderball, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, You Only Live Twice, Diamonds Are Forever, and Dr. No. Calum's got Osmosis at number one, then Thunderball, Goldfinger, Dr. No, From Rush With Love, Diamonds Are Forever, and You Only Live Twice. So what is it that makes these because like i said mine is um from Russia with love and goldfinger in the top two I, I i'm kind of back and forth um then thunderball you only live twice with dr no on your majesty secret service and times are forever for reasons that i've already said but um what makes it to where you guys still think that dr no for rob is still worse and you only live twice is still worse for callum i'm assuming <sighs> dr no is too boring compared to diamonds are forever and you only live twice is too racist <laughs> Yeah, and it's <laughs> like for me, Doctor No is too. Uh, it's it's weird. It's all over the place. But again, it's the first film, so it's probably that. Like, if I didn't know that I was watching a James Bond film and I tried to watch, like, sit down and watch it, I wouldn't stick with it. At least yeah, diamonds. I, I know what I'm getting. Yeah, I I kind of went with the only part. I mean, the racist part definitely does play a big part in it. It's also due to the fact that I think. Uh, Aki dying was disappointing and the fact that like Kissy takes over and she's not really it should just be Aki all the way through mm-hmm. and also I don't I think that Blofeld is worse than this Blofeld because that Blofeld looks really and this one is obviously it's too jokey and it's too camp but at least he's he feels prominent in a role he has a bit of a like a stature to him whereas that one looks like like a scared old man so, and yeah, so I, I think that this one was at least a bit more impressive than the one in your only look twice. 
So, I mean, we're going to roll along here with a lot of the other things we were ranking, like the the girls, ranking the villains and all that. Of course, we're going to keep more track of that later on, but that's just... It's a complicated process, so there's a whole big spreadsheet. And, uh, you know, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, like eight or so different uh, tabs. And we're going to kind of keep that going as time goes on. But we'll wrap that all up at the end of this um, because we still have plenty, plenty more movies to go. Um, Diamonds are forever in the bag. Uh, One thing left to do is to go around here, give you guys some plugs, tell you guys what some other things are that you should check out. You should check out everything else that's happening on fanboysanonymous.com. Check me out at Tony Mango all over the place. And if you're into the pro wrestling side of things, go to smartoutmoment.com and check out everything that's happening there. Subscribe to there, follow all those things, check out the podcasts, the articles, and so on and so forth. These guys have a lot of things that are on more of the wrestling side of stuff. So if you are interested in that, check out what uh, Callum's got, for instance. Yeah, so I think by now in the... Uh the series of this part we would have already finished the paul Heyman's Smackdown podcast but you're more than willing to check that out on the smart cat moment channel there's a big playlist where you can listen to all of the episodes from start to finish it's where me and rob have gone back to the year 2002 and 2003 checked out every single episode of smackdown that paul Heyman was the head writer for so if you're interested in some retro wrestling check that out and if you're interested in more retro wrestling me and rob will be up with a new series maybe even right now as you're listening to this but if not very fairly soon but uh, I won't spoil it as of yet, just because we need to iron out a few details beforehand. Other than that, check out the smartcomoment.com website with all the articles, including the power rankings, because that's the one that I do every single week. And follow me on Twitter at wigbyte 14 Very good, Mr. Wig. Mr. You can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> You can get on me on Twitter at Dude Fleece. You can check out everything I got going on over at Fightful.com and WrestleZone.com. And just keep clicking around and supporting pro wrestling and everything Tony's doing. Yeah, and uh, if you were hoping for the next one to be a little crazy, we're going to get a little bit crazy on some things. We're going to kind of go back to You Only Live Twice as far as, oh, God damn it, with some of the racist type stuff that's happening. Uh, we're going to have some some funny moments, but we're going to also tone things down quite a bit as well. The, I do really enjoy the next film for what it's worth. It is one of the films that has some of the biggest influences on the franchise. We've got one of the themes that most people, not me, love. We've got a villain that people think is one of the best villains that a lot of people know, even if they've only just been really into Goldeneye. We've got, I think, one of the most beautiful Bond women. Uh, we've got we got statues that kill people. We've got snakes. We've got a whole bunch of a lot of things coming your way because we are setting this off into episode 008. The next time around, this podcast will return with Live and Let Die. <laughs>